to West. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Morris Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part One, The Voice of Doom. Coming. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Bickle. John, mind if we come in? What's the idea? What do you think you're doing? Uh, I'm Don't here. you get excited now. Yeah, okay, Whistler. Who are you two? What you, here, let me go. What is that? And what's it? Don't you try any tricks. Who the hell are you? And what's he keep whistling like that for? Oh, nice place you got here. Okay, Whistler, sure. Oh, this is a smashing record player, Mr. Bickle, John. Been listening to some music, have you? What? Now, let me see what kind of stuff you like. Oh, yes. Lovely. Just the job. No. All right, he's all yours, Whistler. No. You can't. No! Now we go. Hey, Whistler. turn up, Roger. Detective Inspector Cornish, you couldn't have put it better. We come here to have a few words with Mr. Leonard Micklejohn. And we find the late Mr. Micklejohn. One bullet, straight through the head. And the gun on the floor right beside him. Yes. He's come a long way since I knew him in AZ Division. I could fancy a flat like this myself. <laughs> Some hope on my screw. Hmm? Of course, when it comes to chief inspectors, I wouldn't know, Mr. West. Well, you'd know soon enough if you had a wife, two young boys, and a mortgage to support. <laughs> uh, Bob, how long since Micklejohn moved out of your old division? Uh, must be two years now. Uh. Yes, that's right. I got my transfer to the yard about six months ago. And he said goodbye to the East End a good 18 months before that. Mm. All right, come on out with it. Out with one. Whatever's buzzing around in that brain of yours. I may still be a new boy at the yard, but I know that look when I see it. I was just thinking that's all. Well, we better get cracking. Call the yard, get a photographer and a fingerprint crew. What? I said... I call... heard you, but why the fingerprint, boys? It's a cut-and-dried case, isn't it? He killed himself. That sticks out like a chimney sweep at a white wedding. Yes, it looks that way, doesn't it? Well, go on, Bob. Get weaving. Chelsea 1492. And a merry Easter tide to you, Mrs. West. Who's... I'm aware the greeting comes a trifle late. Ah, oh, Mark! Mark Lessing! <laughs> However did you guess? <laughs> oh, Mark, it's marvellous to hear you again. Oh, we've missed you. And I you. Mm. That's the worst of having close friends. There's such a damn great gap left whenever you're away from them. <laughs> well, where are you calling from? The flat. Oh, you're back in London. I am. Oh. Long last, Lessing has emerged from hibernation. Uh, does that mean you finished the book? At the ungodly hour of 3.17 this morning, I wrote the two most satisfying words in the English language. <laughs> the end. <laughs> now, the great metropolis is once again graced by my presence, as though he could possibly care less. <laughs> and how's everything at Bell Street? And what's with the yard's youngest, brightest chief inspector? <sighs> well, he's not home yet. Ah, that'll teach you to go and marry a copper. You can't say I didn't try to warn you 12 years ago. Oh, warn me? I've never known anyone try to get his best friend married off so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and how are my two godsons? Asleep upstairs, I suppose? Oh, no, wrong again. They're in Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire? What a... Uh, well, it happens to be the school holidays. Not that I expect a confirmed bachelor like you to remember that. Oh. Martin and Richard are staying with my cousin Paula and her husband. Ah, so you're all alone, are you? Mm. I'm not enjoying it much, to tell you the truth. Isn't it silly? I, 
I, I thought I'd have time to do all sorts of things while they were away, like want some painting again, perhaps. I've hardly touched a brush since art school, but... Oh, somehow... Somehow you just haven't done a thing? Mm. I know it's ridiculous, but the house seems so empty and quiet. Well, I know exactly how to deal with that. I suggest I bowl over and catch a cup of coffee. Or tea. Or even a drink. Oh, all three, if you like. Ghastly thought. <laughs> It'd be lovely to see you, Mark, if you feel like making the effort. Well, all I have to do is to get in the taxi. Roll out the red carpet, Janet. I'll be with you in about half an hour. Lovely. Bye. Bye-bye, Mark. Roger. Oh, Bob. Did you get on to the local station? Yes. A constable's on his way over to stand guard after we leave. Oh, good. What's doing with the Dabs Brigade? Anything interesting showed up? No. The only prints they found are Nickel John's. Oh, on the gun, too? On the gun, too. Well, that wraps it up, then, eh, Roger? Mm, seems like it. But you're still not sure? Oh, I just have a feeling that... Well, never mind for the moment. Uh, Roger, you're, you're not proposing to tell Superintendent Abbott about this feeling of yours, are you? You think I shouldn't? Well, who am I to say what one of my superior officers should or shouldn't do? Oh, come off it, Bob. We're friends, aren't we? Yes, but Abbott isn't anybody's friend. You know, they don't call him the voice of doom for nothing, do they? Do you know, I haven't met one man since I came to the yard who likes working for him. Oh, you're forgetting his sergeant. And Tiny Mears. Yeah. Oh, well, he's the exception that proves the rule. They make a good pair, those two. Do you know, they ought to be in Hyde Park on Sundays, at Speaker's Corner. Beware, the end is at hand. <laughs> the voice of doom and a shadow. Well, that conjures up quite a picture. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's become of Detective Sergeant Tiny Mears, anyway? I haven't seen him around lately. Oh, he's in Bethnal Green on a job. Oh, too bad Abbott's not with him, eh? Yes, it is. Oh, sorry about your night off, Bob. When I asked you to come here with me, I, I didn't think it'd turn out this way. Anyway, you'll be able to pack off home pretty soon, and so will I. <laughs> Mark, that was lovely. Thank you. Pleasure was mine. Piano is in very good shape. Well, and you're about the only one who ever plays it, so you ought to know. Oh, it's good to see you sitting there again. It seemed like ages. Well, you know how it is, Janet. Needs must when the devil drives. Mm. Ah, especially when the particular devil in question happens to be my publisher. Now you've finished the book, are you pleased with it? Well, more or less. I'll ask Roger to take a look at it, of course, as always. After all, what's the sense in having a copper for one's best friend if you can't pick his brains? <laughs> As if you need to pick anyone's brains. Roger says no man can call himself a really progressive policeman until he's read your books. Flattering and completely untrue. <laughs> if my few slim volumes have contained any worthwhile thoughts on crime and criminology, the credit really belongs to him. Oh, I don't believe that, and neither would Roger. Of course, he's helped you a bit now and then, but... Well, what else are friends for? Well, now, let me think. Pour me another cup of coffee, perhaps. Or have I emptied the pot? Um, well, you have, actually, but I, I, I'll make some more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Roger now. Oh. Ah, shh. Don't say a word. Right. Darling! Yeah. I'm in the living room. Okay. Oh, hello, John. Love it. Oh, well, blow me down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That'll take even more lung power than I can muster, Roger. <laughs> Mark, old son, well, it's great to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, too. Now, when did you get back? Just today. Oh. And how are things at the yard? Caught any good crooks lately? Not exactly. Janet was telling me that you're working with the one and only Superintendent Abbott. I am, yes. Uh-oh. I sense a sudden chill in the atmosphere. Something tells me I put my big foot in it. Both big feet, Mark. You've touched a sore spot. I suggest you change the subject. And quickly. Abbott is someone I have to put up with during my working hours at home. I prefer to shut the door on him. If that's all the same to everyone. You whist. Come in. Uh, yes, Superintendent. I've studied your report on the Mickeljohn case, Chief Inspector. Yes, sir. I assume you have no additional information beyond what's included in this report? That's right, sir. And you still say there's more to the situation than appears on the surface, eh? Yes. Now, you don't think it was an accident? No, sir. So you mean murder? That's my opinion. On what grounds do you base that opinion? I've already told you in my report... Mm. And tell me again, Chief Inspector. All right. Well, eh, hey, there's Mickeljohn's record. 
Some small time stuff, admittedly, and nothing recent. B, he's been making a lot of trips back and forth to the continent. And C, the memo we had from Interpol saying they had reason to suspect him of being involved in a number of jewel thefts on the continent. Well, they suggest he may have been responsible for smuggling the stolen stuff out. And D, I go to question him and find him dead. With the gun beside him and his own fingerprints on it. Yes. But suppose we think about the man himself for a moment. A small-time crook who'd come up fast and doing nicely, thank you. I don't see a character like that suddenly putting a gun to his head. But you weren't a fly on the wall at the time, were you? Nevertheless, that's my feeling. A hunch, if you like. But I don't like, Chief Inspector. I don't deal in feelings or fancy intuitions. I deal in facts. And the facts in this case add up to only one thing, suicide. And that's how it'll go at the inquest. Understood? Very well, Superintendent. Now, if that's all. It isn't. When you went to question Mickle John, you took an officer with you who was not officially on I duty. I didn't order Detective Inspector Cornish to accompany me. He volunteered to come when I asked him. I thought he'd be useful to have along since Mickle John originally hailed from his old division. Of course, as it happened... Um... As it happened, you found the man dead. You called in a fingerprint crew. What you should have done was to report to me, first and foremost. Now, you'd better get something straight, West. When you work to me, you go by the book. What's a guy Chatworth chooses to do is one thing. He's assistant commissioner, and if he prefers to close his eyes to the way you ignore the proper procedures, well, that's his affair. And even so, I wouldn't count on any favored status there lasting forever if I were you. What do you mean by that exactly, superintendent? It doesn't matter. Just get it into your head that when you work with me, you go by the book. All the time. I'd have thought you've been long enough at the yard to know that. Anyway, I hope I've made it perfectly clear now. Perfectly. Then make sure it stays that way. That's all. You can go now. Yes, sir. Oh. Hello, Bob. Good morning, Roger. Hope you don't mind me waiting in your office. No, of course not. I haven't seen you around the past week. Where have you been? Oh, we're kneeling. Payroll job. Not much joy, I'm afraid. Well, the villains seem to be having all the luck these days. <laughs> <laughs> too true. Anyway, what's new with you, Roger? Oh, nothing very exciting. A couple of run-of-the-mill cases, that's all. Mm. What happened over that Micklejohn affair? Oh, that's already ancient history. Abbott took the same view that you did. Suicide, pure and simple. Oh, well, suppose you can't win them all, eh? I seem to be winning damn few of them recently. Mm -hmm. And being lumbered with the voice of doom doesn't help, I imagine. Well, lumbered's just the word. I was banking on going off for the rest of the day. It's, uh, it's Janice's birthday. Oh. But as there's no sign of the superintendent, that idea looks as if it's gone for a button. Well, bad luck. Oh, uh, a hmm? note came in for you while I was waiting. It's on your desk. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm done. Something the matter? No, on the contrary. Bob, this is from Abbott. Telling me to go off for the day. What? Well, look for yourself. Well, well, well. I think I'll have it framed. It may be the only evidence that somewhere under that six foot two of navy blue worsted, there actually lurks a real human being. <laughs> oh, hell. Now, Chief Inspector Worst. Abbott here. Oh, uh, uh, yes, sir. You haven't gone yet. Good. West, are you going to be at home for the rest of the day? Well, I'm, I'm taking my wife to the theater tonight. But you'll be in for the afternoon. I expect so, yes, sir. Why, Superintendent? Make sure you are in, will you? Well, look, what is this? You're not planning to call me back to the yard later, are you? I just want to be sure I know where to find you. That's all. Goodbye. Oh, damn and blast him. Something wrong, Roger? Yes, I am. I had thought for a moment that Abbott might bear some remote resemblance to a human being. I don't know what kind of cat and mouse game he thinks he's playing. And quite frankly, I don't care. Just for once. For one day, I'm going to forget about him and the yard and the job. All of it. Oh, toss me my hat, will you? I'm off. I've got to call and pick up a birthday present. Then I'm heading for home. Oh, Roger West, I think you're a dreadful man. Do you now? <laughs> I thought we'd agreed you weren't going to buy me any presents. And I know who'd have been disappointed if I'd have stuck to that idea. <laughs> no. Well, come on, Jan, you're taking all day. Oh. Oh, Roger, it's simply... Gorgeous. No. You sure you like oh, it? Oh, I love it. Oh, and Roger. Mm. Come over here. See what arrived a little while ago. Oh, well, well, well. And who are they from? 
Who do you think? Don't you recognize a set of cups and saucers? No. Now, wait a minute. Aren't those... That's right. Dresden, China. Ooh. They're from Mark's own collection. Well, I call that a very handsome present. Oh, I think it's terribly generous of him. It is. No, it certainly is. Well, Jan, it's about time we made a move or we might not get a table for lunch. Oh, oh well, I'm ready. That was marvellous. You know, food always tastes much better when you haven't had to cook it yourself. Um, can I have some more wine, darling? Roger. Hmm. Uh, what you say, then? Remember me? That blonde at the window table was quite pretty, but you don't have to stare at her quite so hard. No, I wasn't looking at her. Well, who were you looking at, then? The street. I thought I saw someone I know pass the window. I must have been mistaken. Who do you think it was? Tiny Mears. Tiny Mears? Who's he? A detective sergeant. Does all the legwork for Abbott. But it can't have been Mears. He's on a case in Bethnal Green. Well, then perhaps you'll fill my glass for me now. <laughs> no sooner said than done. <laughs> Thank you. Roger, you're frowning. Oh, am I? I'm sorry. What's the matter? That's nothing. Forget it. No, come on. What's wrong? You know, Jan, I'd promised myself I was going to forget all about the yard for today. Well, that's the trouble with being a copper. Your mind keeps working like one 24 hours a day. And what's brought all this on? I keep thinking about Abbott. Wondering why he wanted to make sure I'd be home this afternoon. Well, if he has any ideas about dragging you back to the yard, he can think again. And I shall tell him so personally. And there's another thing. A remark he dropped a few days ago. Something about not relying too long on my favoured status with the assistant commissioner. <gasps> favoured status? Oh, what a load of rubbish. If you, if you do have any special standing with Sir Guy Chatworth, it's only because he thinks you're one of his best men. No, I don't know so much about that. Oh. Well, the way things have been going with me in the last few months... Have... Oh, Roger, no, not that again. Just because some of your cases haven't turned out so well... Oh, more I... than some, Jan, I'm batting way below average. Dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Hmm? Well, of course, as it's as terrible as all that, there's only one thing for it. No? Oh, what's that? Well, you'll just have to leave the force... Oh, no, 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 don't worry, darling. I'm sure we'll manage somehow. Perhaps you could take that partnership Pet Morgan's always offering you. <laughs> That'll do, Jack. I'm not sure being a private inquiry agent is nearly the same thing as being a policeman, isn't it? You, you might even enjoy it better. All right, that's enough. You win. You made your point, Mrs. West. Mm -hmm. Good. Now that's settled, I can tackle a really serious problem. What to have for dessert? Can we have the menu, please? Hello? Mr. Mark Lessing? Yes? This is Pep Morgan here. Pep! Well, hello! This is a surprise. Look, Mr. Lessing, this has got to be quick. I need your help. I've had a bit of information. I got it from one of the Judy coppers at the yard. From whom? One of the women police. Oh, I see. Look, all I'll say now is that it's important and urgent. I want you to help me. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Are you listening? Yes, I certainly am. So let's have it, Pep, old chap. <sighs> Here we are. Tea for two. Ooh, I'm glad we got home before it began to rain. Roger? Hmm? What are you doing at the window? I thought I caught sight of him again with, uh, with the rain. I can't really be sure. Caught sight of who? I thought I saw Tiny Mears again over on the other side of the street. Oh, but didn't you tell me he was in Bethnal Green? Yes, or... I know. Oh, I'm probably just imagining it. Well, come and have your tea. Oh, thanks. When do you think we'll have to leave for the theatre? No later than seven, I'd say. Ah, uh... Well, we've plenty of time. Mm. Here you are. Thanks. Oh, now, who can that be? I'll go. You have your tea. Yes, yes. Coming. Oh. Good afternoon, Mrs. West. Can you tell the chief inspector I'd like a word with him? Well, I'm... If you please, Mrs. West. Uh, John, who is it? Superintendent Abbott. What nurse brought you here? Oh, wait a minute. It's outside the front gate. That is Tiny Mears. May I come in? Yes, all right. Well, surely a phone call would have done just as well, Superintendent. I'm afraid not, Mrs. West. And I'd like to speak to your husband alone. Is there somewhere we can talk privately, West? Yes, I suppose so. The dining room should do. Uh, excuse us, Jan. Well, what's this all about? 
I think you know why I've come. I haven't the faintest idea. And whatever it is, I hope it isn't going to take too long. West, I don't want to make this any more unpleasant than I have to. And I can assure you that taking that kind of attitude isn't going to do you any good. Well, if you mean feeling damned annoyed that you've come here when I'm off duty, then... I mean nothing of the sort. You know precisely what I'm doing here. I've already told you I don't. West, I'm here to search your house. You... You what? I think you heard me perfectly well. I have a warrant, naturally. A warrant? Signed by the assistant commissioner. Hello there, Janet. And how's the birthday West, who's that? What about a kiss for your 21st? That's a friend of ours. Oh, you know him, Mark Lessing. It is your 21st, I take it. Well, West? <laughs> Superintendent, are you trying to tell me that Sir Guy Chatworth has actually signed a warrant for the search of my house? You're entitled to see it for yourself. <laughs> I don't get this. I don't get this at all. I suggest it's high time you dropped all this pretense. Pretense? By God. Now, look here, Robert. Uh, no, what the devil. Do we have to have that din? Oh, damn the din. You're not really serious about searching my house. I couldn't be more serious. I presume you must have some good reason for all this. And you know exactly what the reason is, West. Well, suppose you just tell me. Very well, if you're determined to persist in all this. But will you kindly put a stop to that confounded row? Go all right. Come on. racket? And who blazes up? Oh, my goodness, it's Superintendent Abbott. Why didn't somebody tell me? Mark, just what was the idea? Superintendent, I apologize abjectly. I got carried away. Janet's birthday, you see. I only remembered it this afternoon, and I came rushing over to wish her many happy returns and all the rest of it. I had no idea you were here. Superintendent Abbott's here with a search warrant. A search warrant? And he's about to tell me why. I'm waiting, Abbott. Very well. Apparently you have no objection to your wife and your friend hearing it too. We've received information that today you have accepted a sum of money in return for withholding police action when you knew that such action should be taken. What? Are you suggesting Not that suggesting, my... Mrs. West. I'm saying it. Your husband has accepted a bribe. Abbott, if you imagine I'm going to forget this afternoon's work, you've got another think coming. Oh, just a minute, West. You've had Sergeant Mears and your men go through my house from top to bottom. You've searched me and Mark here. You've even subjected my wife to being searched by a policewoman. Oh, quiet, Jan, quiet. And you haven't found anything, Abbott. Not a thing. I've only been doing my job. Your job? Well, you seem to forget I'm a copper myself. Well, if this was my case, I'd at least have the common decency to tell the man I suspected what allegations had been made and ask for his explanation. I wouldn't burst into his house with a bunch of accusations. I've just been doing my duty and I have not accused you of anything. You mean you haven't charged me with anything because you didn't find anything. But you've accused me of a damn sight too much. I'm going to create hell about this, Abbott, I can tell you. You'd be ill-advised. In your position... My position be hanged. I want three things. An explanation, a complete clearance, and an apology. And we'll start with the first. Who gave you this information about me? I want the name. I think you'd better come to the yard with me, West. If you want me, get a warrant. Do I understand that you refuse to come with me? You understand I refuse to come to the yard for questioning without a formal explanation and the opportunity to take legal advice. Those are my rights. And you damn well know it. I see. In that case, I'll go and make my report to the assistant commissioner. You do that. Roger, no, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's the front door. They've gone. Now, you two have got some explaining to do. Uh-oh. Uh, Mark, I want to know what you and Jan were up to. All that row. And what was all that rubbish about not remembering her birthday? You sent her a present. Thank goodness you didn't mention it in front of Abbott. I was afraid for a moment. You... What was it all about, Jan? What? Um, oh, darling, I don't really know. I just did what Mark told me. And I was acting under instructions, too. Who from? A certain private inquiry agent by the name of Pep Morgan. Pep? Yes. What on earth? Well, he rang me earlier, Janet. All he told me was that I had to get over here, and if Abbott was on the premises, I was to kick up as big a shindy as I knew how. But I still don't see why. Don't you, Jan? 
Oh, yes, yes. It means he must have known Abbott was coming here, and he must have known why. And he also knew that if Abbott had found what he was looking for, I'd be in very serious trouble. You mean... Uh, Pep must have had a very good reason for telling Mark to do what he did. And I think I can tell... Oh, I'll get it. Uh, Chelsea, 1492. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I've done... Oh, Pep, now... Pep, is that you? Oh, well, I thought I'd better give you the chance to hang up if the bogey boys were still with you. All gone, I take it. Yes. So you climbed in upstairs while Abbott was here, eh, Pep? Oh, I might have known you to work that one out. Tell Mr. Lesson from me, he did a very good job. Mm. With a record he kicked up, nobody could have heard me. Pep, what the hell goes on? It's a long story, Roger. Well, let's have the most important part first. What did you find and take out of this house? Oh, you guessed that too, did you? Yes. Well, come on, what was it? Oh, nothing very much. A little matter of a thousand nicker, that's all. A thousand pounds? In nice, crisp fivers. It was in your boy's bedroom, in one of the cupboards. Good grief. Someone was pretty keen for that lolly to be found, and not by yours truly. Someone wants to see you put on the spot, Chief Inspector. And they want it bad. You've been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the first part of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to Crisis for a Copper, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Maurice Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part two, crisis for a copper. A thousand pounds? What, here in this house? Oh, Roger, I can't believe it. I can, if Pat Morgan says so. He found it planted upstairs, Jan, in the boy's bedroom. And took it away? Right under the noses of Superintendent Abbott and his many men. Well, damn lucky for me, Mark, that Pep did. If Abbott had found that money, I'd have been well and truly in the cart. Then I say three cheers for Pet Morgan. If ever there was a walking advertisement for a private inquiry agent, the little man is it. He really turned up trumps. I just wish he'd turn up. He said on the phone he'd be over right away. I want to know the full story. Oh, this, this whole thing's fantastic. And it makes me boiling mad. You accepting a bribe? How could anyone at a yard think a thing like that? Oh, they must be out of their mind. Or oh, Chatworth isn't. He signed the search warrant. Yes, I'm more livid about that than anything else. It's a guy, Chatworth, and I thought he was a friend. He's also assistant commissioner of police and Roger's boss, Janet. Don't forget that. And what's that supposed to mean? And whose side are you on? Oh, don't talk like a nit. You know whose side I'm on. <laughs> Mark Lessing, the original old faithful. That's me, but there's no sense in blinking at the facts, you know. What fact? Chatworth wouldn't do a thing like this, and to Roger, of all people, without some good reason. And that's as maybe. But it's the way he chose to do it, Mark, as though I were a crook, sending Abbott here like a bolt from the blue to go through my house, having you and me search Needham searching Jan. The assistant commissioner's going to hear just what I think about all that, straight to his face. And that should be Pat now. I'll let him in. Evening, Roger. Well, come in, Pat, old son. Sir? Give me your Mac. Right here. Here we are. Well, Janet and Mark Lessing are in the living room. Uh, we've been waiting for you. Right here, then. Uh, it's a fine old how you do this caper, isn't it, Roger? That's one way of putting it. No, you've still got a watchdog outside, do you? What? Abbott's left a man watching the place. Has he? Yes, and not just any old constable, either. He's own detective sergeant. Tiny Mears in person. Well, I hope he... Oh, come on, Pat. Pep. Evening, Mrs. West. Nice to see you. Evening, Mr. Pep. Lessing. Come and sit down. Would you like some coffee? Oh, Tal, very much. All right, Pep. Let's hear it. 
right from the beginning. Well, here's how it goes, Roger. I was having a bit of a chat today, lunchtime it was, with one of the women PCs at the yard, and she started talking about you. Yeah, who was it? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, no names, no pack drill. Well, anyway, she sort of rumbled on about being hauled in on a nasty job for this afternoon, how some money was going to be found in the home of a yard man, and it was going to mean curtains for him. She never said which man, mind you, Roger, but, well, we'd been talking about you, and I got the impression she meant me to put two and two together. Which you did. That's right. Of course, I phoned here right away, but uh, there was no answer. We'd gone out to lunch. Well, then I rang you, Mr Lessing, and made the little arrangement. You did put on a good show, bashing away on that piano over there. <laughs> the row you were kicking up, I don't think Abbott would have heard the last trump, <laughs> let alone me making any noise climbing in upstairs. I don't know how you managed it, Ben. Oh, I don't know myself now, to tell you the honest truth. Oh, I must be out of condition. It's a good thing you've got that tree grown right by the house. Mm. Well, that's about it, Roger. I mean, you know what I found. I told you over the phone. One thousand pounds in notes. That's it. Two hundred fivers in a neat little packet. Oh, I've brought a couple of them along in case there's any chance of tracing them. There you are. I've parceled up the rest and posted it to your flat, Mr. Lessing. I hope that's okay. Pep, everything you do is okay with me from now on and forever. I don't know how we can begin to thank you, Pep. Well, forget it, Mrs. West. The inspector's done me more than one good turn in his time. Pep, the policewoman who tipped you off. Was it Winnie Marchant? Ah, uh, ah, uh, no names, no pactrill, I said, didn't I? Why, was she here then? Yes, she was. Oh, was that the one who searched me? She seemed rather nice. I got the feeling she wasn't very keen on doing the job. Yeah, because she's got a brain in her head, that's why. And it's too bad I can't say the same for the rest of them at the yard. They ought to know the chief inspector wouldn't take a bribe not to save his life. Roger, someone's got their knife into you. And it's all sharpened up and shining. Any idea who it could be, Roger? I mean, who'd want to do the dirty on you like this? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Pep, how do you fancy me as a client? Hey, what was that again, Roger? Well, Pep's a private inquiry agent. I'm asking him to take on an assignment for me. Is that so strange? Well, it is to me. I've never had a chief inspector wanting to hire me before. And it'll also account for your being here this evening, too. With tiny mirrors watching the house, you're sure to be questioned. That's right, yeah. Okay, I'm hired. Now then, how do you want me to start? Well, nose around, see what you can ferret out. Uh, check on anyone not long out of the nick who, who might have a grudge. Yes, I thought of that one myself, but uh, it doesn't sound like an ex-con caper to me. Why not, Pep? Well, the lolly, Mr Lessing, the thousand quid. That's not chicken feed now, is it? No, you're right, Pep. So you get checking on it. Whoever's behind this, and whatever the reason is behind it, one thing's for sure. It's big. It's something damn big. <laughs> Taxi! Hey, taxi! I'm going to stop from the yard, driver. Sir! Please? Excuse me, sir. One moment. Oh, sorry, this taxi's taken. I do hope you won't think it impertinent of me, but I'm most anxious to get to Piccadilly. Would it be too much to ask if I could possibly share the cab with you? Uh, no. No, I suppose not. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's most kind of you. Well, uh, get in. Oh, after you, my dear sir. Yeah. <laughs> it really is very generous of you. I, I'm extremely grateful. To That's you. all right. Did I happen to hear you say that your destination was Scotland Yard? Yes. Am I then in the company of a police officer, by any chance? Yes, as it happens. Does that make any difference? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Sorry. It threw me quite off balance. I hope I didn't hurt you. The driver took that corner much too fast. I should have been holding on to the handle. Oh, not to worry. Uh, no harm done. Uh, no, quite as you say, no harm done. <laughs> wet coat off. Oh. Oh, cigarettes. Ah, yes, in the pocket. One. What on earth? My God. How the hell did that get there? 
Another proposition for you. Okay. Better, even better than before. Chelsea one four nine two. Oh, Mark, it's Roger. What is it? Something the matter? Uh, yes, yeah, something new. Uh, first, the money planted in the house. Now, uh, oh, where's Jan? In the kitchen, washing up. Uh, good. Oh, in case she asks, I've uh, rung to suggest you should stay the night at Bell Street. Uh, it's a good idea in any case, okay? Surely. Now, what's happened? I've uh, just gotten to my office. Yes? I found an envelope in my raincoat pocket, a sealed envelope, no address. Just a single sheet of paper inside, writing in block letters. Listen to this. I'm listening. Uh, dear West, I have another proposition for you. It will pay even better than the last. Meet me at the usual place tomorrow, 7.30, signed K. Just an initial. And you found the letter in your raincoat? Yes. If I hadn't reached into the pocket for my cigarettes. If someone had searched that coat... Well, the thought is enough to bring me out in a cold sweat. This letter is all the evidence Abbott needs. Roger. Get rid of it. Fast. Yes, I intend to. What I can't figure out is how it got into my pocket. It wasn't there this afternoon, or Abbott and his lads would have found it. Well, there's only been one person at Bell Street since then, and that's Pet Morgan. No, I think we can rule him out. So how the... The taxi. What? The man in the taxi. That's got to be it. Mark, I'll hang up now. First priority is to burn this little billet doux. Uh, talk to you later. That's it. Well, Detective Inspector Cornish, something you want? Roger, I, uh, I just like a word with you about. The time to say a word to me was a quarter of an hour ago when I put my head into the recreation room. What did I get? The fish-eyed stare and the cold shoulder from every man there was, was like walking into a graveyard. Oh, no, and no. strange as it may seem, I had an idea that you and I were friends. You know what's being said? And believed, apparently. They say a man's never too old to learn. Well, I'm learning, all right. But it doesn't matter how long you've been at the yard or how you've always done your job, the first hint and everyone's ready to think the worst. Is it true, Roger, what they're saying? Why bother to ask? Because I want to know. Is it? Decide for yourself. Oh, for the love of Mike. Do you imagine I want to believe it? Can't you see I'm just waiting for you to tell me it's a, a load of codswallop? <sighs> oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I shouldn't be taking it out on you. I'll say it once, and that's all. There's not an atom of truth in any of it. That's all I need to know. Well, what do you propose to do about it, Roger? Nail the lie down, of course. Prove that I'm being smeared. Does that mean you know who's at the back of it? No, I haven't the foggiest idea, but I'll find out. You know Pet Morgan? Yes, of course. Well, he's lending a hand. Is there any way I can help? Any way at all? Well, I got a cab here tonight. The driver picked me up in Sloan Square about three quarters of an hour ago. He dropped me off here. I was sharing the cab with a man who said he was going on to Piccadilly. Mm -hmm. Well? See if you can trace that cab driver, Bob. How's that going to help you? Well, I am i want to involve you with details, but if you can track down that driver, get his name and address for me, Bob, it'll help a lot. Right. We'll leave it to me. Good man. On Bob. Yes? Don't uh, do any talking about this, will you? Keep what you're doing for me to yourself. No need for the warning, Roger. Of course I will. Okay, then. Is there anything else? No, not for the moment. Oh, um, have you any idea whether the assistant commissioner is still in his office? It could be. I know Eddie Day saw him about a forgery case a few minutes ago. Fine. There's a case I want to see him about, too. <clears throat> oh, Sir Guy. Hmm? Oh, it's you, West. Uh, good evening, sir. Just what do you imagine you're doing at the yard, may I ask? I'm here for two things, sir. First, an interview with you. You may have seen me just locking my door, Chief Inspector. I'm about to leave the building. And second, to ask for a release from duty. Release? There's no question of anything of that nature. You are suspended from duty, West. That's news to me, sir. I've had no notification to that effect. It's not dated till tomorrow morning. And if you think you can escape the stigma of suspension by asking for a release, you're much mistaken. I seem to have been mistaken about a lot of things. And what is that intended to mean? I was under the impression, Sir Guy, that any man of yours could rely on getting fair treatment, scrupulously fair. It's been quite a shock to find I've been wrong about that. You had your opportunity to discuss this with me? I had nothing of the kind. Your memory seems to be failing, Chief Inspector. Earlier today, you were requested by Superintendent Abbott to come here and see me. You refused. Superintendent Abbott seems to have misled you, Sir Guy. Misled me? He didn't say you wanted to see me. He merely asked me to come with him to the yard for questioning. As I knew nothing of the circumstances and he wouldn't give me any information, I refused. That was the exact situation. <sighs> Go inside. 
Yes, sir. I am gravely disappointed with you, West. I'm disappointed in you, sir. You? Have you taken leave of your senses, Chief Inspector? I don't think so. This is a very serious matter for me. And it's been handled damn badly. If any man under me had dealt like this with a similar case, I'd have had his hide. Would you indeed? Chief Inspector, the evidence that Superintendent Ebert was sent to find was removed from your home. Who did it? That private inquiry agent, Morgan. He was seen at Bell Street. Because I sent for him. And to my knowledge, there was never any evidence in my house which could convict me of accepting a bribe. I've never taken a bribe in my life. I don't know where you got your information. I don't know how long you've had me under suspicion. But I do know that the methods which have been used to try and trap me are outrageous. You've obviously prejudged me. Oh, look here, sir. I know you must have some pretty strong reasons for what you've done. The case must be even more serious than I think. Or you wouldn't have been so arbitrary. But surely I deserve the chance to answer these allegations. My record at the yard should entitle me to that much, at least. <sighs> Sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, how do you explain the sum of £1,750 paid into your account in the Mid-Union Bank Piccadilly over the last three months? What? Seven payments of £250, always in cash, always in one-pound notes. Where did that money come from? I have the remotest idea. That went due west. I use the Mid-Union very rarely. My main account's at Brickley's Bank, Chelsea. I haven't credited my account at the Mid-Union for at least six months. I've seen the account, Chief Inspector. I've talked to the cashiers and the manager. In that case, you must know who made those payments. Certainly. Your wife. What did you say? It was your wife. Well, that's impossible. Here's the description we were given. Read it for yourself. Well? Oh, oh, come on, sir. Jan's not the only attractive, dark-haired woman in the world, now is she? You seem remarkably pleased with yourself all of a sudden. I am. Pleased and relieved. This is obviously one of your main items of evidence, and I can blow it sky high. Indeed. Yes, sir. Janet didn't go into the bank for the simple reason she's never been inside it in all the time I've had an account there. That's easily proved. You just send her there and then talk to the employees again. <sighs> you sound very confident. Perhaps you sent some other woman to deposit the money. Aren't you getting carried away, Sir Guy? I beg your pardon. If I came out with a theory like that without any evidence, you'd tell me to go and boil my head. No, sir. I've been framed. Carefully and cleverly. Someone's gone to a lot of trouble. But whoever that woman is who made those payments, she can be found. And once that's done, we'll know who's behind it and why. Hmm. You're either telling the truth, Chief Inspector, or you're the most convincing liar I've ever known. You're the only one who can decide that, sir? <sighs> For the first time, I... I'm beginning to think that I, I may have been mistaken about all this. Does that mean I can have the release from duty? Why do you want it? To get to the bottom of this business for myself. Well, Sir Guy, do I get my leave of absence? I'd like your answer, please. Suspended from duty? That's right, Jan. I don't follow, Roger. After all that, Chatsworth's still going to put you on suspension? Yes, Mark. Oh! No, no, easy does it, Jan, love. Don't get your paddy up. It's already up. As far as I'm concerned, that's the end of Sir Guy Chatsworth. I'll never feel the same about him again. No, no, no. Calm down. Listen. He had no choice, things being what they are. As long as there's any room for suspicion about me, leave of absence won't do. He has to suspend me. But he did give me the impression that he expects me to dig around. And he's prepared to listen to anything I come up with. I should think he would be. Oh, well, for a start, I'm going to clean up this thing about you and the bank. You'll be paying a visit there tomorrow. Did he say who's supposed to have been bribing you, Roger? No, he's pretty evasive about that. My guess is he doesn't really know. Hmm. It's been going on since the middle of January, I gather. That's when those payments to the mid-union started. I'm supposed to have hit on some smart racket around that time and taken money to hold my tongue. Abbott's been in charge of the investigation from the beginning. And I bet he's enjoyed every minute of it. He's a... Oh, he's a snake. Roger, mm. I don't have to go to the bank with him tomorrow, do I? No, uh, Bob Cornish gets oh. the job. I think Chat was afraid you might scratch the superintendent's eyes out. Well, I'm not the violent kind, but I'm prepared to make an exception for Mr. Abbott. Roger, do you think Bob Cornish can manage to trace that taxi driver for you? Well, I've got my fingers crossed. It's the only lead to the character who shared the cab with me and slipped that envelope into my coat. What I don't understand is why, darling? Why this deliberate attempt to frame you? That's what I'd like to know. But I've got one other useful item of information. Chatworth gave it to me. What? The name of the man who dropped the squeak about the thousand pounds, which brought Abbott and crew here this afternoon. Well, come on, Roger, don't keep us in suspense. 
It was Joe Leach. Leach? Well, now, that is a bit of a teaser, isn't it? Mm. Why, well, I do know him. Well, I met him once some time ago on a case Roger let me help him with. Who is he, then? Well, Joe Leach is a bit of everything, John. Runs a betting shop in the East End, has a half share in a pub. But his main claim to fame is that he's a regular source of information to the police. Ah, is that why Mark called it a teaser? Yes. Leach's information is usually pretty reliable, which explains the decision for Abbott to take action. Mm. Well, the way I see it, Leach passed the tip on for one of two reasons. Either he really believed it was true, or he's been got at himself in some way or the other. I want you to find out which it is, Mark. Me? Yes. I discussed it with Bob Cornish, and he agrees with me. We'll keep it unofficial. After all, you've done this sort of thing for me before, so it's one for you to handle. I'll do my damnedest. You can count on that. Oh, no, I think it's time we got to bed. Oh, it's been a long day. Not one of the best. Well, let's hope for better things tomorrow. Well, I don't know about you two, but uh, I fancy a cup of tea before turning in. Mm. Is that uh, is that too much to ask, Janice? No, of course not. I'll go and put the kettle on. It won't take a minute. Thanks. Roger, I wanted Janet out of the room for a moment. There's uh, something I'm a bit worried about. Oh, what's that? The business of the bank deposits, the attempt to tie Janet into all this. How do you mean? Well, on the face of it, it seems to have been done just to strengthen the evidence against you, but it might also mean that the family is likely to be involved in the future. Mm. Yes, I see what you're getting at. Oh, but I don't think that's very likely, Martin. Of course, the boys are in Gloucestershire for the school holidays, so they're all right, aren't they? Martin and Richard. <laughs> yes, I should say they're all right. The worst that's liable to happen to those two is bellyache from eating too much fruit from the local <laughs> orchards. And as far as Jan's concerned, well... I admit, I'll feel easier in my mind once she's paid a visit to the mid-union in the morning. I'll be happier when that little item's cleaned up. Well, there's the bank. On the other side, Mrs. West. Oh, yes, I see it, Inspector Cornish. Oh, your husband calls me Bob, why don't you? Thank you. Okay. Now, you know the drill. Oh, yes. But, Inspector... Bob's the name, um, remember? Yes, Bob. What if anything goes wrong? Now, you've got nothing to worry about, Mrs. West. I just can't help feeling nervous. Oh, forget it. It'll be a breeze, you'll see. But this kind of identification thing... I mean, I've heard of cases from Roger where sometimes it all goes haywire and a completely innocent person... Oh, now, <laughs> stop worrying. All you do is cross the road and go into the bank. Pay the money into Roger's account as if it's a normal, everyday thing. Yes. Now, once I've seen you come out, I'll nip in and do my stuff. Oh, uh, we'd better fix a meeting place, hadn't we? Yes, I suppose so. Now, let's see now. Uh, ah, that should do. That coffee bar along there, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, I just hope everything will be okay at the bank, too. Now, look, the one thing you mustn't do is seem nervous when you get in there, understand? It's just an everyday thing. Yes. Yes, of course. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> now, take a deep breath... And off you go. Hey, wait for the traffic lights. Uh, Chelsea, 1492. It's me, Roger. A mark. Have you had any news from Janet yet? No, but it's a bit early. Um, I wasn't expecting to hear from you so soon either. Well, what about Joe Leach? Any luck with him? You won't be very happy about this, I'm afraid. He wouldn't do any talking. He can't do any talking. He's dead. Dead? He was found early this morning, Roger. He was murdered. Good God. I'm at the local police station mm. now, trying to get as much information as I can. Uh, Mark, there's someone at the door. Find out all you possibly can and get back here. Okay. Bye, Roger. Uh, bye. All right, all right. I'm coming. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Can you tell me if Mrs. West is at home by any chance? No, I'm afraid she isn't. Oh, what a shame. Of course, I should really have telephoned to arrange a convenient time to see her, but as I happened to be driving through Chelsea... Well, I'm her husband. Um, can I help at all? Your Chief Inspector West. Oh, that's right. My name is Fleming, Mrs. Raymond Fleming. Uh, would you care to come in, Mrs. Fleming? Well, thank you. Just for a moment. I shan't stay, Mr. West, but I'd appreciate it if you would tell your wife that I called... Here, let me give you my card. Oh, thank you. The European Relief and Assistance Society. I'm the president. Yes. And our offices, you see, are in Welbeck Street. Oh, yes, yes. 
We're a bona fide organization, Mr. West, properly registered as a charity. Your wife's name was given to me as someone who would be sympathetic and might agree to lend her services. Oh, I see. Well, um, she does one or two things in that line, uh, mainly in connection with the school our two boys go to. There are a couple of other organizations here in Chelsea. Oh, is that how you came to hear of them? Yes, I imagine that would be it. Mm. Uh, Just what does your society do? Well, our aim is to help Europeans who come to settle here in this country. (laughs) You might say it's my own little hobby horse, Mr. West. I was responsible for starting it all. It's not a welfare organization for refugees. There are a number of other bodies who deal with that. We're primarily concerned with helping professional people from every sphere, medicine, science, engineering. Mm. Do you think your wife would consider helping us? Well, I really don't know. I'm told she'd be a very valuable person to have, just the kind we need. Well, I'll tell her about it, naturally. And will you use your good offices to persuade her? I'm sure you can be very persuasive indeed, Chief Inspector. Mm. Well, I'd say that's much more likely to be true of you, Mrs. Fleming. (laughs) How very flattering of you. I mustn't keep you any longer. Thank you so much for giving me so much time. Not at all. I'm sure you must be very busy with all sorts of strange and mysterious cases. As it so happens, I am, Mrs. Fleming. Really? Well, I'm certain you'll find out the truth. I'm sure nothing could stay hidden from you very long, Mr. West. I'll say goodbye now. Yeah, goodbye. And thank you again. Yeah, not at all. Hmm. Uh, Chelsea, 1492. Oh, Roger, darling. Oh, Jan, uh, is everything all right? Uh, what happened at the bank? Everything's fine. When Bob Cornish questioned the cashiers, they said they'd never seen me before. Oh, thank the Lord. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Hmm. Oh, it's such a relief. I was half afraid they might go crazy and actually say... Yes, I know. Well, at least this should satisfy Chatworth. I'll get on to him right away. Well, there's no need, darling. Bob Cornish has already called the yard and reported. Oh, that's great. He's getting me some coffee at the moment. He's really being awfully nice. Oh, where are you? At a coffee bar near the bank. As soon as I've had coffee, I'll make my way home. Fine. As a matter of fact, I've just shut the door on a visitor. Uh, for you, Jan. Oh, who? A lady. Very beautiful, very elegant. Bowled up in a silver-gray rose and a silver-gray mink that you'd Ooh. give your eye teeth for. <laughs> I'll tell you all about it when you get home. All right. I'll catch a bus in Victoria Street. I rather fancy a walk through St. James's Park. Bye for now. Bye, Jan, love. <laughs> Silly things. Like the ducks, do you? What? Oh, <laughs> yes. Doesn't everyone? Not me. I'm more interested in you, Mrs. West. What? You see, now he's... Uh, what are you doing? You see, I said no screaming, no struggling, what? unless you want to get hurt. <gasps> now we're going to take a little walk, you, me, and my mate. <laughs> Just you be a good girl and behave, or the chief inspector won't recognize that nice face of yours. Now, let's go. Walk. You've been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the second part of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to Fear in Flat Nine, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Calling Chief Inspector West. Calling Chief Inspector West. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Morris Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part three, fear in flat nine. Uh, 
Uh, Chelsea, 1492. Is that Chief Inspector West? Yes, who's that? I've got a little message for you, Inspector. Who's speaking? Never mind about that. It's a message concerning your wife. What? Didn't she ought to be home by now? I reckon if I was you, I'd be wondering where she's got to. <laughs> what the hell? Who are you? That don't matter. But your missus matters, didn't she? What's happened to her? Ah, oh, now that'd be telling, wouldn't it? Look, what have you done to her? That's all for now, Inspector. Bye-bye. Jan. Jan. Oh, if anything's happened. Oh, come on, answer it, damn you. Scotland Yard. Oh, uh, this is Chief Inspector West. Yes, Inspector. Put me through to Detective Inspector Cornish and make it snappy, will you? Yes, Inspector. Just a moment. Oh, come on, come on. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, Chief Inspector. I'm getting no answer from his office. Well, find him. Find where Bob Cornish is and tell him to call me back immediately. You understand? I'm at my home and there's no time to be wasted. Oh, damn and blast him. Where the devil's he got to? Hello? Oh, Bob, thank the Lord. I've been waiting for over half an hour. Uh, what taxi driver? Oh, uh, well, forget about that for a minute. Uh, listen, Bob, you were with my wife this morning. Yes, in a coffee bar. I want to know what time she left you. About 11.30. You're sure? I see. Thanks. Hmm? Oh, it's, uh, she's just a bit late getting home. Now, what was that about the cab driver? You've traced him. Okay, let's have his name and address. Hmm? Good, I've got it. Nice work. Oh, uh, that's the door. It might be Jan. Uh, uh, bye, Bob. Jana. Oh, it's only you, Mark. Only me? Well, there's a nice thing. Uh, come in, come in. Roger, is something wrong? You've got a face like a thundercloud. Mark, it's, um, it's Jan. What's happened? Well, let's go into the living room. I'll tell you as much as I know about it. Oh, whoever's cooked up this caper, they're really out to make a thorough job of it, aren't they? Yes. Someone's certainly keen to see you in trouble. And the worst kind, for a copper, taking bribes. Oh, it's a nice, tidy little frame-up. First the thousand pounds planted in this house, then the gentleman in the taxi slipping that envelope into my pocket, and those seven payments Jan was supposed to have made to the mid-union bank. Well, at least that's been cleared up. Only partly. What? But you said both the cashiers admitted they'd never seen Janet before. True, but there's still the other woman to find. The one who pretended to be Jan and made the payments. Mm. No, but that's for later. Right now, I'm calling the yard. I'm going to talk to the assistant commissioner. What about? I want a general alarm put out for Jan. Now, wait a minute. Sir Guy Chatworth may have had me suspended from duty, but he can't refuse me this. Give it a bit longer, Roger. If you get Chatworth to put out an alarm, and the next minute Janet just walks in the door, well... You'll be less popular with him than you are already. She won't just walk in the door, Mark. Can't you understand? She's been grabbed. Oh, and if any harm's come to her, so help me. I'll get whoever did it if it takes me the rest of my life. And when I do, I'll break their necks with my own hands. Easy now. Take it easy, Roger. Look, let's sit down for a few minutes. I haven't had a chance to tell you what I found out about Joe Leach and his murder. Well, I can wait. There are a couple of things I haven't told you either, but they can all wait. I'm getting on to chat with. All right. If your mind's made up... I'll take it. Chelsea, 1492. Roger! Jan! Oh, thank oh. God to hear your voice. You okay? Oh, Roger, Jan, darling. Jan, are you all right? You're not hurt. No, 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 no. No, what I'm all right, happened? but I... Well, I don't think I've ever been so scared. Well, where are you? What happened? I'm in Chertsey. Chertsey? Good heavens. Jan, tell me, tell me what happened. Well, I was walking through St. James's Park when these two men hmm? came up to me... They threatened me and made me go with them. They said I had to do as I was told if I didn't want to get hurt. Yes, go on. Well, it was incredible, really. All those people all around, and I, I just had to walk between them. They, they took me to a car and made me get in. They drove off, and then they... Well, they didn't say another word. Mm. Every time I tried to speak, I was told to shut up. It was terrifying. I didn't know what they were going to do with me, but when we got here to Chertsey, they... Stop the car. And then what? Well, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? But just what I say. They told me to get out of the car, and then they drove away. Drove away, just like that? Mm. I started walking till I found the railway station. Oh, right. Oh, I tell you what. 
You get the next train. I'll check the time and meet you at Waterloo, okay? Yes, yes, all right. Oh, I feel a lot better now I've talked to you. Ah, there's my girl. Well, I'll be waiting on the platform, Jan, love. Bye. And I'm afraid that's about the best description of them that I can give you, Roger. Hmm. Well, it's something to go on. But what I can't understand is why they did it. For my benefit, Jan. Your benefit? Oh, you mean as some sort of warning? That's it. Our friends, whoever they are, laid on this little demonstration to show me they can make you do a disappearing trick any time they feel like it. Oh. Jan, I've got an idea. I think you should go up to Gloucestershire. What? Well, stay with the boys for the rest of their school holidays. Well, your cousin would be glad to have you. And, well, there's nothing Martin and Richard would like better, is there? Oh, no. You can put that idea right out of your head this minute. Now, listen, Jan. No, I said... If you imagine I'm going off and leaving you at a time like this... Look, darling. After 12 years of marriage, if you don't know me better than that, well, you should. Look, I'm staying here and there's nothing more to be said. Now, take me home to Bell Street. What I want more than anything else at this moment is a good, hot cup of tea. Uh, oh, that's better. A cup of tea works wonders. Good. <laughs> now, it's upstairs with you, my girl. You're going to lie down for a bit. I'm not going to lie down. I'm fine. I'm home and I'm fine. A rest wouldn't do any harm, Janet. Oh, for goodness sake, Mark, stop fussing over me. You're like a couple of old hens, a pair of you. Oops, a daisy, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's a lot I have to be brought up to date on, isn't there? Not just you, Janet. Roger and I haven't had a chance to compare notes either. Well, all the better. Mark, you haven't heard anything from Pep Morgan yet, I take it? No, but he'll be busy chasing it up right enough. Mm. No, 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 what's this? If you two are going to be cryptic, how am I supposed to know what's going on? Um, now, what will your personal private inquiry agent be chasing up, may I ask? The taxi driver. The one who took me to the yard last night. Then you've tracked him down? Well, Bob Cornish did, as he promised. He got the name and address. I, I rang Pep about it before I left to pick you one. So now we cross our fingers and hope the driver can remember where he dropped the chap Roger shared the cab with. Mm. You're really certain, Roger, that he was the one who put the bribery note into your pocket? Well, it couldn't have been anyone else. And I've got to find him, Jan. He's the only link to whoever's behind this whole frame-up. And the reason for it. Well, surely not the only link. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid he is. Well, what about that man Mark was going to see? What's his name? You know, the, that police informant. The one who tipped off the yard about the money that had been planted here in the house. Joe Leach, Esquire. He won't give any more information to the police or to anyone else. He's been murdered, Jan. Murdered? Yes. He was found shot in the flat above his betting shop. What did you get out of the local coppers, Mark? Very little. Even with your name as a password. Mm. Haven't they any idea who killed him? Oh, yes, they've got ideas, but no evidence, Janet. They seem to favour a character by the name of Malone. Oh, who's he? He's rather a tough customer, from what I can gather. He runs a mob of strong-arm boys in the area. Malone, Malone. Mm -mm. Now, that doesn't ring any bells with me. Well, according to the police there, he's the big wheel behind the local protection racket. But they've never been able to pin anything on him. He's known popularly as the Whistler. Apparently, it's a habit of his. The Whistler? Hmm. And he operates in the AZ division. I'll have to ask Bob Cornish. That was his old patch before he got transferred to the yard. Hmm, I wonder. You wonder what? Well, on the face of it, it's, uh, it's too damn small a thing to read anything into it, but... Roger, hmm? you're going cryptic again. <laughs> oh, come I? on, come on. You can't wet our curiosity and just leave it at that. Well, I was thinking of the Micklejohn case, if you must know. Oh, yes. Well, I'm no wiser. What exactly was the Micklejohn case? You know, it happened before all this bribe trouble began. The night you were here, actually, Mark, your first night back in London, Bob Cornish and I found a man named Micklejohn dead in his flat. Uh, it all ended up with a difference of opinion between Superintendent Abbott and myself. Abbott won. Went down as suicide. What makes you think of that now? Well, this character Mark's just mentioned the Whistler. How come? Well, we talked to all of Micklejohn's neighbours. They all said they heard nothing except one. An old chap in the flat next door. Now, he thought he heard someone whistling. Ah, you mean to say you think... Well, I can't exactly jump to any conclusions about it, Mark. I mentioned it in my report. Abbott didn't even think it was worth considering. Just the same, I'll have a word with Bob Cornish about this whistler Malone. Oh, shall I? No, no, I'll get it. Uh, Chelsea 1492. Roger, Pep Morgan here. Ah, uh, Pep. What luck, old son? Any news? Yeah, I managed to see your taxi driver. Well, did he remember where he set down the man who shared the cab with me? He was going to Piccadilly, he said. Yeah, well, he changed his mind then, didn't he? Huh? According to the driver, he got out at the end of Welbeck Street. Welbeck Street? I don't suppose he saw where the fellow went by any chance. Yes, as it happens, he did. Into one of the houses. Is that so? Pat, I'll meet you at the end of Welbeck Street in half an hour, let's say. Okay with you? 
Sure, yes, but Roger, it's a bit of a wild goose chase, isn't it? It might be. On the other hand, it might not. In half an hour, Pep, bye. Mark, you stay here with John like a good chap, will you? Right. I don't want her left alone. Oh, now, Roger. Don't argue with me. I haven't got time. I get the impression that there's some special significance about Welbeck Street. Would I be right? Perhaps. While Joan was going through the identification business at the bank this morning, and um, oh, you were following up the Joe Leach thing, yeah. I had a visitor here. Oh, yes. You mentioned that to me over the phone. A woman, you said. A lady, I said. And a very elegant specimen of the species. Mrs. Raymond Fleming. She wanted you to lend your services to her organization, Jan, the, uh, the European Relief and Assistance Society. She's the president. She gave me her card, and as it so happens, their offices are... Are uh, in Welbeck Street? Exactly. Huh? Could be just a coincidence, of course, but it could also be something a good deal more. That's what I'm off to find out. That'll be the next house along, Kurt. Yeah. Ah, here we are. Now, this is it right enough, see? On the board there. Oh, yeah. European Relief and Assistance Society, ground floor. Oh, come on. Inquiries. Right, Pep, you stay put here. I'll go in, and we'll see what we'll see. Good afternoon, sir. Well, well, now, fancy that. What did you say? And uh, good afternoon to you, too, young lady. Is there something I can do to help you? Well, I think there very probably is. Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd take 250 pounds in notes and deposit the amount to my account at the Mid-Union Bank. Uh, my name is West. Uh, I don't understand. Oh, I'm sure you do. It's quite a simple thing to do, isn't it? And you've already done it seven times before, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, your appearance certainly comes close enough to that of my wife. For a general description, anyway. I'm afraid you're making some kind of mistake. You know, the cashiers at the bank will be able to identify you. I have no idea what you mean. Now, if you have any proper business here, will you please say what it is or go away? Lois, my dear. Mr. Pickle. Well, and who have we here? Is anything the matter? Not any longer. I beg your pardon? Is there something we can do for you, sir? Well, suppose we put that the other way around. Is there something I can do for you? Such as letting you share another taxi with me, for instance? I'm afraid I don't follow you. You did last night. In Sloan Square, Mr. Um, Pickerel, is it? Yes. We rode together in a taxi as far as Scotland Yard. Oh, my dear sir, I'm afraid you must be confusing me with someone else. I was at home last night, the entire evening, with friends. Oh, is that a fact? A demonstrable fact, sir. And now I must ask you to leave. The young lady and I have work to do. We're very busy. All right, sir. If you insist. I do. Come into my office, please, Lewis. I yes. have a letter to dictate. Yes, of course. Uh, but uh, don't be surprised if you see me again, will you? Goodbye. Pat. Right here, Roger. Well, what happened? Well, I think I've set the cat among the pigeons. Nip in there, Pat. See if you can hear what's being said in the inner office. Now, if anyone comes out, you've uh, well, come to the wrong shop, something like that. Right here, then. I'll wait for you out in the street. Go on. In you go. Quickly and quietly. Roger. Hmm? Ah. Well, how'd you make out, Pepper? Chief Inspector, we've hit the jackpot. That's the girl who paid the log into the bank, all right? I knew it the moment I saw her. What do you hear? Well, the geezer I couldn't catch all of it, but the bird, her name's Lois Randall. Hmm. Oh, I've got her address for you, too. Good. She'd left her handbag on the desk, so I took a quick butcher's inside. Anyway, you've put the wind up her and no error. Have I? Good. Well, I don't know so much about that, Roger. What do you mean? Well, the geezer tried to calm her down at first, but when that didn't work... He started putting the frighteners on her. Did he? Yeah. He told her she'd better behave herself, you know, obey orders. Or she knew what he could do to her. You know, I felt a bit sorry for her. Don't ask me why, but I did. Sounds to me like he's got her well under the cosh. In that case, the sooner we take charge of her, the better, for her sake as well as mine. Now that I've got your evidence, too, we should be able to get her to talk. And that just might break the whole business wide open. Mm, in one stroke, eh? Yes. Pep, get to a phone, call the yard, ask for Bob Cornish. Oh, if he's not there... You'll have to talk to Alan. Oh, the voice of doom. He gives me the willies. Mm. I hope I can get on to your friend Cornish. Just get moving. Uh, what about you? Well, I'm going back for another word with the girl. Off you go, Pep. Get cracking. Excuse me, Miss Randall. Go away. 
I've come back to give you a piece of advice. Now, don't take any more risks. Get out of this mess you're in before it's too late. I'm prepared to help you, Miss Randall. I don't know what you mean. Go Look, away. don't play games, girl. You're in trouble. Go, please. And you're scared stiff. That sticks out like a sore thumb. I've said I'll help you. I know what happened here after I went. I know what Pickerel said to you. Do you really, Mr. West? But... I'm afraid you're rather an impetuous man. And you're a stupid one. Put that gun down. It seems that we'll have to reach an understanding, you and I. Lois, go into my office. But, uh... Do as I say, my dear. Yes, all right. You're only making matters worse for yourself, Pickerel. Follow, Miss Randall. And don't think of doing anything reckless. I'm quite prepared to use this gun if I have to, I assure you. Into my office, please. Now, we must clarify the situation. It's clear enough. And I warn you, Pickerel... But you're in no position to deliver warnings. You no longer have any official authority, as I understand it. You've been suspended from duty. Oh, and just how do you happen to know that? It's not important. Stand over by the filing cabinet, please. Lois, you come here by me. All right. Now, first of all, Mr. West, how did you find this address? Our mutual taxi driver was traced, Pickerel. That's what led me here. Is that the full truth? Why shouldn't it be? It was only because of the taxi driver, nothing else. I just told you so, haven't I? Now, tell you something else. You can't get away with it, Pickerel, gun or no gun. Oh, but I can. Because you don't appreciate the whole position. Let me sum it up for you. You think Miss Randall might be persuaded to clear you of suspicion about the payments made to your bank. And so allow you to regain your standing at Scotland Yard. I'm afraid you must think again, Mr. West. Must I? Miss Randall may have been the messenger. But someone must have given her the money. Correct? Correct. If she is questioned, she will say it was you, Mr. West. Isn't that so, Lewis? Uh, Answer me, my dear. And remember what you have at stake. Mr. West seems to think that you're in some kind of danger. But you know that nothing can happen to you so long as you obey instructions. And you will, won't you? Yes. Yes, I will. Thank you. So you see, Mr. West... I see. I don't altogether understand how you still happen to be at liberty, but if Miss Randall were to make a statement along the lines I have indicated, you certainly wouldn't remain so for very much longer. Lois, stay where you are, West. All right, all right. Listen to me, Lois. I don't know what hold this man has over you, but I hope you realize that perjury is a serious offense. She takes her orders from me. Like the man who grabbed my wife today? Was that done on your instructions, too? Was it pickle? I said don't move. Unless you want a bullet. Please... Please, Dorothy says. I thought that little incident of your wife might have taught you something. But perhaps now you have a more complete understanding of your circumstances. There's nothing you can do against me, Mr. West. Your only course is to forget all about your visit to these offices. Otherwise, you will find yourself in far greater difficulties than those you have experienced already. You've made one mistake. A bad mistake, Pickerel. Really? And what might that be? You assume that I was the only one who overheard your conversation with Lois. That's what you told her? It was a slight um, inaccuracy. Hmm? It was someone else entirely who overheard the two of you. What? Now, I'll admit that as things are, my own word against Miss Randall's might not carry much weight. But an independent witness is quite another matter. West, if you imagine you can bluff me... That's no bluff. And as for you, Lois, I think when you find your false evidence can be demolished, you'll come to your senses and tell the whole truth. Take no notice of him. He's lying. Am I? Roger. Who's that? Roger. There. Please come in. Well, everything's under control. Stone me. This is your witness, I take it. Shut the door. I said, shut it. What's all this, then? Get over there, beside West. And don't try any tricks. Sir, uh, that gun won't help you, chummy. The coppers are on their way. The police? I got onto the yard all right, Roger. Good man. I don't believe it. You're bluffing. Ah, uh, not when there's a pistol pointed at me, mate. Lewis, the bottom left-hand drawer of my desk... There are papers in it. Yes. Quickly. Give them to me. All of them. Right. Now, empty that waste paper bin on the floor. Pile on everything from the top of the desk as well. Now, set fire to them. Here. Oh. He's bonkers. Pickerel, you can't start a Shut fire up. in here. Go on, girl. Do as you're told. Yes. Light it. Now, get out of here, Lewis. Go on. Go. You fool. Stay where you are. Damn it, man. You'll have the whole place on fire. Don't move. Either of you. And don't try to come after me or I'll shoot. I mean it. <laughs> See what you can do about the fire. 
I'll get petrol. No, you won't. You leave him to me. Pap, come back. I'm at the smaller car. Come back here. Pap, come back. Pap! Stanwell back there, please. Well, you've all seen an ambulance before, haven't you? Keep back, please. Mark, how is it, old son? The doc says I'll live. Well, you'd better. Rushing off like that after Pickerel. Yeah, well, if I hadn't, you would have. Then you'd have copped it. Any old doubt wants a bullet in the leg between friends, eh? Uh, Roger. He got away, didn't he, that Pickerel geezer? Yes, he got away. Bob Cornish and his lads arrived just too late. Excuse me, sir. Got to get the patient in the ambulance now. Oh, uh, yes, of course, yes. Anything you'd like in hospital, Pepper? Uh, <laughs> yeah, just a couple of dolly nurses, that's all. <laughs> OK, you blokes. Heave away. Uh, no, no, wait a bit. No, hold on. What's wrong, Pepper? Roger, I didn't give you her address, did I? That Lois Randall bird, I mean. Oh. It's uh, flat nine... 23 Chapel Streets and John's Wood. 23 Chapel Street, thanks. <laughs> and all the panic, I forgot about that. Yeah, I don't know how you're going to get on without me and no error. Radio blokes. Now I'm ready for the blood wagon. Shove me in. Uh, Jan, it's me. Roger, thank goodness you phoned. Mark and I are on tender hooks here. What's been going on? Oh, plenty. But it'll take too long to tell it all now. I just wanted you to know that I found the man who shared that taxi with me. You did? Oh, good work, darling. Not so good, Jan. He got away again. But I've been on to Superintendent now, but a general alarm has gone out for the gentleman. Well, he's sure to be caught then, isn't he? Yeah, I hope so. Oh, I also found the young lady who impersonated you at the bank. But, Roger, that's marvellous. That means you're clear to the whole frame-up. Bribery, everything, once and for all. Not quite. I've got to produce that girl. And she's done a disappearing act, too. So there's an alarm out for her as well? No, I, um, I didn't tell Abbott about her. Why on earth not? Well, that's part of the long story. The point is, Jan, I'm still no nearer to finding out what's behind all this. I've got the girl's address. I'm on my way there now. Bye. tell you there's nothing wrong. Why can't you believe me? Because I'm not blind, Lois. That's why. For heaven's sake, Bill. But you're in a hell of a state. And I want another oh, reason. please don't keep on about it. Look, I'll keep on until I get it out of you. But for the love of Mike, what else do you expect? We're supposed to be engaged, Lois. I go to a lot of trouble to organize a spot of leave just so that I can get down from Scotland to see you. And what happens? Oh, Bill, please. Hmm. He wouldn't even open the door to me till I'd told you who it was. Now, what the heck's been going on, girl? What are you scared of? Will you leave me alone, Bill? Why can't you stop asking questions? I've got to ask them. Lois, if you won't tell me what's the matter, how can I help you? You can't help me. No one can help me. Bill! Someone at the door. Well? Aren't you going to see who it is? No. Lois, why? No, no, it might be... It might be who? All right. I'm going to see who's there. No, don't open it. Please, Bill, don't open it. Yes, not him. Do you mind if I come in? That depends. Who are you? He's a policeman. He came to the office this morning. Oh, send him away, Bill. I won't say anything. Send him away. You heard the lady. You better be going. I don't know who you are, but I suggest you take it easy. Miss Randall is in a lot of trouble, and threatening noises from you aren't likely to help matters. Suppose we shut this door, first of all. Why did you let him in? Bill, I told you. Calm him. down, Lois. I can handle this. My name is West, Chief Inspector West of Scotland Yard, and you are... Um... I'm Bill Tennant, Lois's fiancé. Right, Mr. Tennant. Now, you'd better understand that I'm here in a private capacity. I'm not on duty. My inquiries at Lois's office today were not official. She can help me, and I'm hoping she will. No. Send him away, Bill. Oh, surely you're not frightened of the police, Lois. She's even more frightened of someone else. Who did you think it was when I rang the bell, Lois? I... Did you think it was Pickerel? No, I thought it was... Well... Who were you going to say? No one. Oh, Chief Inspector, what is all this about? I can't get any sense out of Lois. She's in trouble, Mr. Tennant, and because of her, so am I. She's been 
persuaded to contribute towards ruining my reputation at the yard. I don't believe it. Lois. You shouldn't have opened the door. I told you not to. But you didn't know I was ringing the bell. And you didn't think it was Pickerel, so who were you frightened of, Lois? No one. I told you, no one at all. Why can't you leave me alone? Why can't you... What is it? Can't you hear? So that's who it is. The whistler. That's who you're afraid of. Whistler Malone. Yes. And he's here now. Outside that door. You've been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the third part of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to A Call from the Whistler, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Maurice Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part four, a call from the whistler. It's him. He's come to my flat. He's here. Lois. The whistler. I knew. I knew he'd come. Lois, sweetheart, what are you so scared of? I've never seen you like this. Who is this whistler? Inspector West, do you know? I heard of him today, Mr. Tennant, for the first time. His name's Malone. He runs a mob of strong-arm boys. And what's he got to do with Lois? Well, you better ask her that. Uh, I've got another idea. I'll ask him. Bill, no. Don't open the door. Lois, I'm going to settle this right here and now. About time. Step aside, sonny boy. Lois, doll, I don't like it when I'm kept waiting. Oh, don't Wrap do Wrap up, sonny boy. I'm talking to the girl. Well, suppose you talk to me instead, Malone. Well, well, look who's here. The yard's bright boy himself, Chief Inspector West. The bent copper. <laughs> Taking any good bribes lately? Well, let's have a little chat about that, shall we? <laughs> now, don't make me laugh. You can't throw your weight around any more copper. You're suspended. The yard's giving you the bullet. So beat it and take Sonny Boy here with you. The doll and I are going for a little ride. Like hell you are. Bill, don't. There's nothing you can do. You heard him. Do a scarf the pair of you. On your way before I have to get rough. Go ahead. Get rough. Tenant, watch Keep it. out of watch this, it. Inspector. I'll take care of it. All right, Whistler or Malone or whatever they call you. Show me how rough you can be. Oh, no. You ask for it, Sonny Boy. Ah! Tell it, watch out. Uh, uh, fast enough, Malone. Oh. Look out, he's got a knife. You what? Uh, 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 now. now. Ah. Uh, right, Mr. Whistler. Uh, let's see you whistle your way out. Uh, uh, this will make certain. Tell her, wait. No, Mr. Uh, oh, damn it. I reckon that's the last we'll see of Mr. Whistler Malone. Bill, you fool. You don't know what you've done. <laughs> I took him down the stairs. That's what I've done. Oh, Lois, sweetheart. You don't have to worry about a job like that. Does she, Inspector? Well, it's plain to see you don't. You handle yourself very well, Tennant. I should do. It's my job, you might say. Is it? Oh, no, I'm combat. I'm an army instructor. <laughs> oh, is that so? Well, I'm blown. Oh, it's not funny. Malone won't forget this. You don't know him. You don't know what he can do. No, I don't. And it's more than time I did, Lois. Well, do you mind leaving, Inspector? My fiancé and I have to have a private talk. I'm afraid I can't go yet, Tennant. I've got a strong personal interest in all this. Miss Randall has some explaining to do. No, leave me alone. I've got nothing to say. I, I can't tell you anything. I can't. Lois! No. Lois! Uh, Tennant, she can't get out of the flat through that room, can she? No, she can't. Then but... I suggest you leave her alone for a little while. Let her have a good cry. Might help. Look, what the devil's this all about? What's Lois got to explain to you when... What did you mean before that whistler hoodlum turned up about her ruining your reputation at Scotland Yard? Well, she contributed to it. Someone's been making an effort to frame me, Tennant. A damn good effort. 
I'm suspected of accepting bribes. Sir Guy Chutworth, my assistant commissioner, has suspended me from duty. But you say Lois is involved in it? Yes. So just how is she involved? Well, for a start, she's been impersonating my wife, depositing sums of money in a bank account of mine. Lois has? Oh, you can't be serious. There's no doubt of it, I'm afraid. Well, I just can't believe it. Lois mixed up in this sort of thing? Yes. I'm stationed up in Scotland, Inspector. I wangled this leave earlier than I expected. I didn't let Lois know. I thought I'd make it a surprise. Looks as though I'm the one who got the surprise. You had no idea she was in any kind of trouble? Not a clue. I turn up and I find her like this, terrified out of her life. She nearly fell through the floor when she saw me. How long have you and Lois been engaged? <laughs> Only a couple of months. Happened on my last leave. As a matter of fact, I practically had to bully her into it. She kept trying to find excuses. She's a frightened girl, Tennant. And it's more than Whistler Malone. There's a man named Pickerel. I'd say he's the one responsible for Malone turning up here. Yeah, I know Pickerel. is her boss. Now, that society she works for, what, what's it called? The European Relief and Assistance yes, Society. Yes, that's it. Well, our Mr. Pickerel is closely involved in my frame-up. There's a police alarm out from at this moment. Good grief. And there'd be one out for Lois, too. Except that I haven't told the Yard about her part in it. Oh? Why not? Well, she's been acting under pressure, and I want to know what that pressure is. And I... I want to help her. Uh, because she can give evidence to clear you. Yes, but not only that. I'm thinking of her, too. You can believe that. Yes. Yes, I do. I don't mark you down as a liar. Thanks. Now, is there a phone in this flat, Bill? No. Oh, but there's a public one, though, on the next landing up. Right. I think we need a bit of help. All right, Mark, I'll answer it. Chelsea 1492? Oh, it's me, John. Oh, Roger. I hoped you'd ring. Well, listen, mm. I'm at 23 Chapel Street, St. John's Wood, flat number nine. Got that? Yes, darling. Now, I want you and Mark to come over here as fast as you can make it. Now, if there's a yard man still watching our house, oh, then I... But I'm... there won't be, surely, not any longer. Well, I'm far from being in the clear yet, Jan. I'm still under suspension. And if I know my superintendent, Abbott, he'll have Bell Street under surveillance. Not just till I prove myself innocent, but till he's got it in writing and in triplicate. Oh, don't mention that man's name to now, me. Now, look, the vital thing is that you mustn't lead a yard man here. Somehow or the other, you've got to lose him, understand? Yes, yes, of course. I'll tell Mark and we'll get over to St. John's Wood as quickly as possible. That's my girl. Bye for now. Bye, darling. Mark! Right here, Janet. Who was oh. that, Roger? Yes. He's given us a bit of a problem. Now, you're the one who writes books about crime and criminals, Mr. Lessing, so it's up to you to come up with a solution. Well, I can't but try. What's the problem? Well, Roger says that... Oh, Lord, who is it now? Chelsea 1492? May I speak to Chief Inspector West, please? Oh, I I'm sorry he's not here at the moment. Oh. Would that be Mrs. West by any chance? Yes, that's right. Mrs. West, this is Mrs. Raymond Fleming. Oh, yes, Mrs. Fleming. Roger told me that you called here this morning. Can you tell me when your husband will be home, Mrs. West? I must speak to him. It's most important. Well, I'm afraid I can't say, but I'll be seeing him. Could I give him a message? Will you see him before this evening? Oh, yes. Then please ask him to come here at 7.30. It's number 11, Bannock House, Hampstead. Very well, 11 Bannock House, at 7.30. You will make sure he gets the message? Of course, Mrs. Fleming. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mark, you're quite sure you weren't followed? As sure as I can be, Roger. Oh, good. We changed taxis twice, then we used the underground. And changed trains a couple of times just to be on the safe side. Fine. Well, I've given you an idea of the situation here. Have you been able to get anything more out of the girl? No, I haven't had a chance yet, Jan. <sighs> She's still in that room with Bill Tennant. It's a dicey one, all right. Yes. We've got to try and nurse Lois Randall into a better frame of mind. Now, she can give us the key to a large part of this whole affair, I'd say. But knowing what she does means that she's in danger. So she has to be protected. And by the sound of it, her boyfriend's not bad at the protecting side of things. <laughs> I'd like to have seen him dealing with the whistler. I'd like to have seen him being a little bit less impulsive. I had a few questions to put to Malone about Joe Leach's murder and the death of Leonard Micklejohn. But the point is, young Tennant's made himself a bad enemy today. When you talk about protection for the girl, you mean police protection? That's the last thing I mean, Jan. Oh, but Albert would never get anything out of her. With his tactics and in her present state of mind, she'd, she'd just collapse, I think. No, we have to cope with this ourselves and wait till she's ready to tell us what she knows. So the thing is, what to do with Miss Randall? Mm. And she mustn't stay here. Quite apart from alone, there's the police to think of. Abbott's certain to check up on her. The trouble is, since being suspended from duty, the only information I can get from the yard is whatever Bob Cornish feels he can safely pass on to me. 
And I'd say by now, Abbott and Cornish will be investigating Mrs. Fleming's society. <gasps> oh, my goodness. What? Mrs. Fleming, I forgot. Uh, forgot what? Yes, she rang me just before we left Bell Street with a message. She wants to see you this evening, and she said it was most important. Did she? Well, as it happens, I was planning to have a talk with the lady myself. But more important, let's get back to Lois Randall. We've got to find somewhere to hide her away for a while, somewhere safe. And there's young Tennant, don't forget. He'll want to be with them. Well, what's wrong with putting them in a hotel? Mm, too many people in a hotel, Jan. Yes, too easy for her to give us a slip. Well, not if it's a small one, one of those family hotels. Yes, you could be right at that. Ah, and I think I know just the one. Leggett's Hotel in Buckingham Palace Gate. I know the proprietor. He's been very helpful once or twice. I'll go up and ring him now. No, Mrs. West, I don't see the point of it. But, Mr. Tennant, haven't we explained... Hiding away in some hotel? I don't see why it's necessary. Because you and Lois are in danger, Tennant, that's why. No, I'm not hiding from a rat like Malone. I can take care of myself and of Lois. Oh, look, don't talk like a fool. And don't get carried away with yourself just because you smack Malone down once. Roger's right. If the whistler won't come alone next time, he'll have a bunch of his muscle boys with him. And you'll stand about as much chance as a snowflake in hell. Inspector West. Yes, Lois. I can't pretend I wouldn't be glad to hide somewhere, but that doesn't mean I'm going to tell you anything. I think you should know that. Yeah, she means it. I spent an hour trying to persuade her, but it was no go. Well, we're not worried about that for the moment, are we, Roger? No. The first priority is to see that you're safe, Lois. I just don't want you to think I'm coming with you on false pretenses. There's no question of that, Miss Randall. I've arranged everything with the hotel. And the faster we get you out of here, the better. So let's get moving, shall we? Yes, that's right. I want them round here at Leggett's Hotel right away. Yes, that's right. Goodbye. Oh, Mark, just the man I want. Yes, Roger. Where's Dan? In Miss Randall's room with her and Tennant. Oh, good. Mark, I've just phoned Pep Morgan's office. Oh, yes? <laughs> well, thank goodness he doesn't run a one-man private inquiry agency. If I can't call on the yard for help, at least there are his chaps to turn to. What's the latest on Pep himself? Well, they got the bullet out of his leg. Ah. He's resting comfortably in the hospital. I'm glad to hear it. I've asked for two of his operatives here at the hotel to help keep an eye on Lois Randall. You can give them the drill when they arrive. Won't you be here? I've got an appointment, remember? Oh, of course, with Mrs. Raymond Fleming. Mm, at 7.30. Uh, Mark, uh, say nothing to Jan. But if you haven't heard from me within an hour after that at 8.30, call the yard. Right. Get straight on to the assistant commissioner if you possibly can. Is Chapter likely to be there at this hour? Well, if he's not, uh, get hold of Ampert. Or failing him, Bob Cornish. Right, I will. But Roger... You're talking as though this might be some kind of a trap for you. Mm. Well, I don't know whether it is or not. So I'm taking precautions. Now, one thing's for sure. Mrs. Fleming didn't come calling at Bell Street this morning simply to inquire if Jan would do some work for her society. And with any luck, perhaps I'll find out what the elegant lady was really after. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. I'm here to see Mrs. Fleming. Uh, my name is West. Oh, yes, sir. Madame is expecting you. Thank you. This way, please. Thank you. Mr. West, madame. Thank you, Rosa. That would be all. Yes, madame. Oh, Inspector, I'm so relieved that you've come. Relieved, Mrs. Fleming? I've been worried in case you didn't get my message. I wanted you to come now, at this time... Because I knew my husband wouldn't be here. No. Oh. I'm afraid Raymond's attitude to my society and the work I do for it isn't exactly... <laughs> but please, do sit down. Very well. You'll find cigarettes in the box beside uh, you. Not for the moment, thank you. Then can I offer you a drink, perhaps? Mrs. Fleming, I don't want anything to drink or smoke. And most of all, I don't want you to beat about the bush. I trust you're going to be completely frank with me. Oh, you're referring to my little pretense when I called at your house this morning... I hope you'll forgive me for that. No, Mrs. Fleming, I won't forgive you. I beg your pardon. The purpose of your visit this morning was to draw my attention to your society, isn't that so? Yes. But because you weren't completely honest with me, because you indulged in your little pretense, I came close to stopping a bullet. And a good friend of mine did stop one. From a gun fired by your employee, Pickerel. Inspector, you must believe me. I'm terribly distressed about all that. You know what happened in Welbeck Street? The police contacted me. Superintendent Abbott. I see. Inspector West, I know the trouble you're in. Yeah, well, a hell of a lot of people seem to know. So it was Abbott who told you. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted you to come here this evening. It's really why I came to your house in the first place. I hoped you'd look into things at the society and be able to find everything out for yourself. And what is everything exactly? 
Inspector, I want to help you, if you'll help me. Oh. So there are strings attached, are there? You're after some sort of bargain? Not as you mean it. You can judge for yourself. All right. I'm listening. First, you must understand how much the society matters to me. As I've implied, my husband doesn't altogether approve. It's really the only bone of contention between us. That's why I haven't told Raymond anything. Come to the point, Mrs. Fleming. Well, the point is that some kind of illegal activity is going on. I overheard Pickerel in a phone conversation. It was enough to tell me that my society was being used. And your name was mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. It came as a frightful shock. I didn't know what to do. And uh, just how long have you known about this, Mrs. Fleming? Quite some time, Inspector. Well, didn't it occur to you to, to go to the police? How could I? I had no idea what it was all about. I only knew there was something, and that the girl, Lois Randall, was tied up in it. My first impulse was to dismiss the two of them immediately. Then I had a better thought. Oh, what was that? Come over here with me, please, Inspector. Well? I'd like you to listen to this tape recording. It's all set up. Oh, so that's what you did, was it? Yes. I had Pickerel's office bugged, is the term, I believe. Mm. There are more tapes in that cupboard, but this is the only one with anything of real value on it. You'll find it particularly interesting, I think, Mr. West. Oh. Listen closely. No, please, I, I won't do it. We're not going to have any more foolishness of that kind, are we, my dear? Uh, turn the sound up, will you? Hmm. Of course you'll do it. The money is in that envelope. You'll deposit the amount in the Mid-Union Bank to Inspector West's account. Exactly as you have done before. No, not again. I won't. Don't be a stupid girl. Do I need to remind you of what will happen to you if you don't do as you're told? Why are you doing all this? Why are you trying to ruin this man? That's no concern of yours. What's he ever done to you? Very well. To avoid these tiresome displays of temperament in future, I'll tell you just this. On a certain day, some months ago... West was concerned with something which could possibly be dangerous to me and my friends. What the devil is he referring to? If by any remote chance he should stumble upon the truth, it could do a great deal of harm. What could it? And this is my way of preventing it. And let me have no more trouble from you, my dear Lewis, or you know what the results will be. Now take that money and go. <coughs> hmm... I wonder if West would ever really... <coughs> the unlucky 13th <laughs> superstition. That's all there is, Inspector. Mrs. Fleming, it's more than enough. This is all the proof I need to clear me at the yard. Um, I can take this tape, can I? Of course. No, thank you. There's no other copy of the tape, so do take care of it. Oh, don't worry, I will. And I really am very grateful to you, Mrs. Fleming. Then will you help me to protect the society? That's all I want. If there's any scandal or publicity, it might very well destroy everything we've been working on. I'll do all I can. That's a promise. Thank you, Inspector. Now, too bad there's nothing on this tape to indicate exactly what Pickerel and his friends are mixed up in. You're sure there's no hint on any of the other tapes? Quite sure. I just don't know what it could be. The only thing that occurs to me... Hmm. You'll probably say it's too fantastic. Well, tell me and we'll see well, as you know, the society is concerned with Europeans who come to live in this country. Not only from Western Europe. We've dealt with quite a number of refugees from the Iron Curtain countries, too. I wondered if it might be something political. You know, espionage activity, something of that sort. Yes, it's a possibility. Societies like yours have been used as a cover for spies... Oh, what? Uh, oh, that's Rosa, my oh, maid. I'll go and see. I... Don't try nothing silly, I love you. Who are you? What do you mean by... Button it, lady. Any of us... Who's that? Uh, they call him the Whistler. These will be a couple of his thugs. Wrap up, I told you. Well, what do you know? The bent copper. Twice in one day, my lord. You get around too much, West. Curly. Right, Whistler. <laughs> Hold still, copper. The last time you had a right smart geezer with you. What was his name? Tenant. Here's something to pass on to him. You swine. Shut your trap, missus, or you'll get the same. There'll be no need for that, Malone. Piccolo. Well, well, I, I might have guessed. Shut up. You. I'm glad you're here, Inspector. I shall have some questions for you. 
About Lois Randall and her whereabouts, for instance. But first, I have more pressing business. With you, Mrs. Fleming. What do you want? It's a little matter of some tape recordings, my dear lady. I don't know what you're talking Please about. Please don't waste time with denials. We've discovered that my office was bugged, and obviously for some time. Now, could that be why the inspector is here? Malone, search him. Alt still, copper. Uh, nothing. He's clean, Pickerel. Which means he hasn't received anything yet. Very well. Now, Mrs. Fleming. I'll deal with her. All right. <laughs> Malone, let her go. Belt up. Come on now, Miss. The tapes are a broken arm. What's it to be? Mrs. Fleming, tell them you've got no choice. In there, in the cupboard. Let's take a look. Yes, there you are. A whole batch of them. But there can only be a very few that matter. Which ones are they, Mrs. Fleming? I don't know. Cut the fairy stories. Don't know. They're oh, all grab the lot of them, Pickerel, and let's get out. Well, why load ourselves with anything more than necessary? We have everything under complete control here, and there's a tape recorder. It shouldn't take so very long to find what we want. Pickerel, you're wasting time. You've gone through three quarters of the tapes, and there's nothing worth worrying about. There must be something on one of these tapes. Possibly more than one. I'm taking no chances. What's behind all this, Pickerel? Framing me using the society. It's something big, isn't it? Huh? West, you were told to wrap up. Shut your mouth or you'll find a shut for you for good and all. One more on the list. Is that what you mean? To add to Joe Leach and Mickle John? How the hell did you... Whistler! The cops! What? They're coming. The police? Just seen them. Two cars coming up the drive. We must get out. I'll take the rest of these tapes. Use the back way. But first, Mr. West, just something to remember me. Bye! Uh... Oh. Okay, everybody? Now we scarper. Uh. Oh. Oh. oh, Inspector. Huh? Thank heavens you're all right. Oh, Mrs. Flannick. Oh, your poor head. Oh, what did he use on me? A battering ram? <laughs> it looked like a, a cosh. Yeah, that'd be it. Did they uh, get away? Yes, the police were just too late. I, I don't know how they happened to arrive. I'm just so thankful that they did. A friend of mine. Good thing he did as I asked. Superintendent Abbott is here. He's in the library. But in that case, I better... No, you stay where you are. You mustn't try to get out. No, I must. Uh, the tape. Pickerel took the tapes, Inspector. No, not the one that counts. In that Chinese bowl on the table next to the tape recorder. Bowl? I don't understand. That's where I dropped it when Malone's strong arm boys burst in. Oh, yes, here we are. You see? It was there all the time. Yes, right under their noses. But that's wonderful. What is wonderful, Lynette? Raymond. Am I allowed to know what's going on here? I come home to find my flat filled with policemen. Raymond, dear. And who is this gentleman? Chief Inspector West. Another one. This is my husband, Inspector. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Fleming? I shall do much better, Chief Inspector, when I've heard what all this is about. Oh, yes, darling, of course. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the whole thing. Well, Raymond, aren't you going to say anything? I'm afraid you won't care for what I have to say, Annette. I find this whole story quite incredible. <laughs> Mr. Fleming, If I... you please, Chief Inspector. Annette. All this only serves to convince me that I've been right all along about this society of yours. Raymond. Admirable as it may be to possess a social conscience, my dear, it shouldn't be allowed to rule one's head. You see the results. You have become involved with thugs and criminals. I think you should know that your wife behaved very bravely, Mr. Fleming. If that's fact, meant as an admonition, you can spare yourself the effort, Chief Inspector. I'm completely devoted to my wife. And what I resent is the fact that she should ever have found herself in such a situation when it was necessary for her to behave very bravely. But I'm all right, darling. And at least the inspector can now prove he's been unjustly victimized. Yes, Mr. Fleming. And thanks entirely to your wife. If any benefit has been derived from the whole wretched business, I'm glad, naturally. But that doesn't affect the main issue. I shall have to persuade Annette that charity, as the phrase has it, begins at home. Any outside applications of it are best exercised in the form of a check. Oh, now, darling. I'll uh, have to ask you both to excuse me now. I must talk to Superintendent Abbott. Inspector West, you won't forget your promise about the society? No, Mrs. Fleming, I won't forget. Goodbye. (laughs) 
Here? Over here, Malone. Oh, what are you doing in here? I'd have said the saloon bar would be more your style, Pickle. Well, the public bar's safer. More crowded. And don't use my name. What's this? Getting a touch of the nerves, Miss Arwe. I am. It's not for that reason. There's a police alarm out for me, you may remember. There'll be one out for me, too, by now, I shouldn't wonder. But you don't see me shivering in my size eights, do you? Anyway, we're among friends here. Now, listen to me, Malone. No. You listen. There's someone we both know who wouldn't like to think that you're getting into a panic, Mr. Pickerel. It's all going wrong. Can't you see that? Well, what I see is that you've got a glass in your hand and I haven't. I'll have my usual, Jimmy boy. Uh, right, I was left. Now, suppose you calm yourself down, my friend. That's easy to say. But I can see the way things are turning, even if you can't. And what way is that? Oh, don't be a fool, man. Too many things aren't working as planned. First, the business with West. That frame-up was supposed to put him out of the way. Instead, he's walking around <laughs> large as life. And with a hell of a headache. Yeah. Your point, Whistler. Thanks. <coughs> Here's your health, Pickerel. This Malone, don't you understand? You've got it bad, haven't you? We are in this together. Don't forget that. No, oh, I don't. Not for a minute. And now that West's got onto the society, what if he gets onto the other thing? The 13th of January? Is that what you mean? Of course. And if he does, then he'll... Pickerel, I'll give you a bit of advice. Just you get hold of yourself. Pull yourself together. You'll never get better advice than that, my friend. Not if you were to live a hundred years. Maggot Hotel, good evening. Yeah, room 17, please. Hello? Jan. Oh, Roger, thank God. I've been so worried, it's so late. Well, first chance I've had to ring, Jan, love. I've been closeted with the assistant commissioner. Is that where you are now? At the yard? Back at my own desk, Jan, and it's official. What? You mean... That's right. Sir Guy Chat was lifted my suspension as of ten minutes ago. Oh, darling. But how? Why? Well, I got hold of a tape recording. It clears me completely. Chatworth accepted it with no reservations. <laughs> and he seemed glad to do it. I'll say that for him. <sighs> then it's over. All mm. over. Oh, darling. Darning the relief. Yes, you can say that again. But it's not all over, Jan. Not by a long shot. Now I've got to find out exactly why I was framed and the real reason behind it. What it was designed to cover up. As far as I'm concerned, this is where the case really begins. You've been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the fourth part of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to A Girl for a Hostage, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Maurice Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part five, a girl for a hostage. Well, let's see. January 10th, 11th, 12th. Ah, oh, here we are. Ooh, my head. What? Oh, Superintendent Abbott. That's you, is it, West? I saw the light on in here. Wonder who it was at this hour. Thought you'd gone home. Any minute now. Just getting something out of my files. I'd have said you'd had enough for one day after taking that caution on the head from Whistler Malone. I'm still on my feet. Uh-huh. Only just by the look of it. Oh, I survive. You'll be putting an alarm out for Malone, of course. It's already been seen to. Good. But he'll have gone to ground. He and that pickerel character. That's for certain. Not too bad they got away. If you and your man had just happened to get to the Fleming's flat five minutes sooner... If my aunt had just happened to be my uncle, she'd have ridden a man's bicycle. 
I'm not complaining, Superintendent. Lucky for me you showed up when you did. And I'm damn glad I arranged with Mark Lessing to call you. Yeah. Would have been simpler to make the arrangement with me in the first place, West. Would it? When I was suspended from duty? And now that's no longer the case, Chief Inspector. Let's hope you'll stick to the proper procedures for the future, hmm? A superintendent, there's, um, there's something I'd like to ask. Well? When we were in Sir Guy Chatwood's office and he lifted my suspension, I had the feeling that you didn't agree. Did you? Don't go by feelings, West. I've told you that before now. And I was mistaken. You do approve. The assistant commissioner's made his decision. It's now a fact. That's all I go by. Facts. Well, here's another fact. The attempt to frame me indicates some big operation, and I'm going to find out exactly what it is. Don't get any fancy one-man band ideas. You're still working under me, I'll remind you. That's precisely the point. And because we've got to work together smoothly, I'd like to know just where we stand. If you still have any reservations about me, any suspicions, let's have them out in the open. You're forgetting yourself, Chief Inspector. Look, you listened to that tape recording. You heard the conversation between Pickerel and Lois Randall. You don't imagine I could have faked it all, do you? You'd have to be crazy to think that. West, if I... You... For this once, Chief Inspector, I'll make allowances for you. You've had a bad time. Taken a beating from Malone and his mob, so I'll overlook it. Now, I suggest you get off home. Or to that hotel where you've got the Randall girl hidden away. Oh, is that it? Is that what's got your back up? Very well, if you must know. I consider it highly irregular. If that girl has any information, she should be brought to the yard for questioning in the proper manner. And you'd never get a squeak out of them. You heard what I told Chatwith. Lois Randall's scared. She's under Pickerel's thumb for what reason, I don't know. That is as may be. And she's in danger. There's nothing Pickerel and Malone would like better than to get their hands on her. That's why I put her and her fiancé in Leggett's hotel. My wife's there as well, so is Mark Lessing. Now, if we can protect that girl, get her to trust us. She might tell us what she knows. There is no point in going over all this again, West. The assistant commissioner has decided to allow you leeway in the matter, so there's nothing to be gained by discussing it any further. No, there isn't, is there? We'll never see eye to eye, will we? We just don't look at police work in the same way. So I'll say good night, superintendent. Or should it be good morning? Darling? Hmm? Oh, oh, good. You're awake. It's all right, Mark. In you come. Good morning, Chief Inspector. Oh, what's all this? Breakfast in bed, sir. Yeah. Now, what about you two? Oh, we've had breakfast. No, oh, have you? Yes, down in the dining room with Miss Randall and Bill Tennant. Now, how is the girl this morning? Well, she's very quiet. She's hardly said a word. Yeah. I told them what happened to you last night. I thought if she knew about Malone assaulting you, it might make her more willing to talk. But all it did was to make her even more subdued than ever, I'm afraid. Well, of course. What else could you expect? The idea is to reassure the girl, not, not scare her even more. It was a damn silly thing to do, Mark. You're right, of course. I'm sorry, Roger. Still, maybe our fiancé will persuade her to tell us. Young Tennant got pretty head up about it. It was as much as I could do to restrain him from tearing out to help look for the whistler. Would you like me to pour your tea now, Downey? Oh, yes, thanks, Jim. What I'd like is to hear all about that tape recording. Come on, Roger, the suspense is killing me. <laughs> well, we can't have that, can we? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jim. Well, Roger, all I know is that it was a conversation between Pickerel and Miss Randall, and it's put you in the clear. Yes, but there's more to it, Mark. It seems that my frame-up was organized as a precaution, a safety measure. How do you mean? Oh, apparently, one day, some months ago, I was connected with a case that put the wind up Pickerel and his friends, whoever they may be. They were worried I might have stumbled on the truth about it. So uh, there must be something I missed. Have you any idea when it was? Yes, John, a very good idea. On the tape, Pickerel muttered something about the unlucky 13th and superstition. So that means the 13th of the month... But which month? January. How do you know that? Well, it's easy enough to work out, Jan. Mm, not for me, it isn't. Well, think a minute. Those payments Pickerel forced Lois Randall to make to my bank account. Oh, yes, yes, I think I see it. Those payments started in January. And the first one was in the middle of the month. But that's great, Roger. All you have to do is to check up on what you were doing on the 13th of January, and you'll know what Pickerel and his friends were so worried about. Simple as that, then. Huh? Well, isn't it? No, I'm afraid not. Oh, Roger. I thought just as you did, Mark. That's why I dug this, uh, this file out. My reports for the 13th of January. But if there's anything here that I overlooked, I'm damned if I know what it is. Well, what were you doing on that day? Well, I was in my office at the yard most of the morning, winding up some reports on suspicious activities by a number of aliens resident in London. <laughs> well, that turned out to be a storm in a teacup. 
Then I was called south of the river to Battersea. Spent the rest of the day there. On what? A murder case. Ah, oh, wretched little business. The victim was a man named Benny Cox. He owned a house in Newfield Street. It was let out as rooms, except for the basement, where he lived with his brother Alfred. Oh, any more tea going, Joe? Yes, of course. Well, the local police charged the brother with the murder. The two men were known to be on bad terms. There had been frequent quarrels and all the rest of it. Yeah, darling. Oh, thanks. But when it came to the trial, Alfred Cox got off. The evidence against him was mainly circumstantial. He had a good defense counsel and the jury acquitted him. I gather he sold the house in Newfield Street and left London. Mm, I see. Hmm. Oh, for the life of me, I can't find any connection between all that... Oh, blast! What? I'm an idiot. What if the Battersea business has nothing to do with it at all? Suppose what Pickerel meant was the other case. But the thing with the aliens? Yes, Jan, yes. Maybe that wasn't such a storm in a teacup after all. I just remembered something Mrs. Fleming said when she gave me the tape before Malone and Pickerel burst in. Well, what did she say? She wondered if her society was possibly being used to cover some kind of espionage activity. Oh. You see what I mean, Mark? Suspected aliens, yes. the European Relief and Assistance Society. That certainly sounds like a connection. Jan, take this tray, will you? Now, Roger West, just what do you think you're doing? I'm getting out of bed. Oh, no, 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 you're, you're not. You're to stay there all day. Now, that head of yours... My don't... head's got to go to work and take me with it. Oh. Now, you two can look after things here. Jan, I want you to talk to Lois Randall. See if she'll confide in you. She just might respond better to a woman. If you do get anything out of her, you know where to get me. At the yard. What did you say? Espionage? Yes, Superintendent. You're sure you're not going over the edge on this, West? Where this case is concerned, I'm not sure of anything yet, sir. Yeah, well, it seems a bit far-fetched to me. Well, there's no harm in checking on it, is there? Merely a matter of having a word with the commander in charge of the special branch. See if he or the security men have any reason to suspect the European Relief and Assistance Society. Mm. Well, have I your okay to go to Sir Guy chat with about it? My okay? Chief Inspector, you wouldn't be trying to take the mickey by any chance. Not at all, sir. Just going by the book. Observing the rules as you require, Superintendent. In which case, as your superior officer, you should know that I'm the one to speak to the Assistant Commissioner. I'll take it up with him sometime today. Right, sir. You'll let me know the results, won't you? Good morning, Bob. Roger. It's good to see you. Here, grab this chair. All right, thanks. Oh, I'm damn glad to know you're in the clear. Congratulations. Well, thanks. News gets around fast. <laughs> Too true. When it comes to rumor and gossip, I've discovered the yard's worse than a girl's school. <laughs> anyway, it's great to have you back. Oh, well, feels pretty good, I must admit. Even though I still have the voice of doom to cope with. Superintendent Abbott, yes. and we all. <laughs> Roger, have you got any clues as to what was behind your frame-up? Well, nothing definite enough to call a clue. Now, tell me, Bob, have you still got a man watching Welbeck Street? And... The European thing in Miss Society's yeah. offices? Yes, they're under observation. It's not to do with me anymore. Abbott's put his own detective sergeant in charge of it. What, Tiny Mears? Mm. Now that he's no longer needed to watch my house in Bell Street, huh? All right. Well, uh, what are you doing, then? Well, I'm off down to AZ Division to do some nosing around. Abbott's idea. Seeing it's my old manor and Whistler Malone's stamping ground, he thinks I might get a lead on where Malone and his mate Pickerel have got to. Well, I hope you do. If we can lay our hands on that pair, especially Mr. Pickerel, we'd break this case wide open. Maybe. But if you ask me, it's the last place Malone would hide out. Or perhaps that's just what he'd like us to think. Mm, could be, I suppose. Anyway, you've still got the other string to your bow, haven't you? Hmm? That girl, Lois Randall. Well, how did you come to know about that? I've not just told you. This place is just one big gossip factory. She uh, hasn't talked yet, I gather. Uh, no, not yet. I'll bet Abbott's not happy about that. Mm, you'd win your bet. He wants her brought back to the yard for questioning. But for the moment, Chatworth's letting me play it my way. Of course, that position could change. Oh, how, Roger? Well, if Abbott should decide to make an issue out of it, and the assistant commissioner should change his mind, I'd have no option. Oh. Mm. I'd have to take Lois Randall out of Leggett's Hotel and bring her here. All I hope is that Jan gets the girl to talk before anything like that happens. I've told you, Mrs. West, it's but... just a waste of time asking me now, questions. Lois, dear. It's no use. Oh, for Pete's sake, Lois. Uh, Mr. Anyone Tennant... would think we were trying to do you harm. All I want is to help you, me most of oh, all. Bill, I've told you and told you, you can't help me, nobody can. How the hell do you know when you won't even give us a chance? M Mr. Tennant, I think you ought to leave us alone, then Lois and I can have a little chat just by ourselves. Oh, all right. If you think you can do anything with it, I obviously can't. Bill! 
He's really angry with me. Well, it won't last. No man could stay angry for long with a pretty girl like you. Now, how did you come and sit down? Here. All right. There, that's better. What a beautiful ring that is, Lois. An absolutely gorgeous diamond. Did Bill give you that? No, it was... It was my mother's. Mm, lucky girl. I'm a mother, Lois. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I have two boys. Martin's 11 and Richard's a year younger. They're up in Gloucestershire with my cousin at the moment for school holidays. Oh. But when they're at home, oh, they can be quite a handful. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> but there's one thing. If ever they find themselves in trouble, they come straight to us with it. To me or to their father. Mrs. West... No, 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 don't say anything. I just want you to listen for a moment. You're in trouble. You're frightened. We're trying to help. And it's not because we need you to clear Roger's name. It's no longer necessary. He has already done that for himself. We know that man Pickerel forced you into doing what you did. And we brought you here to protect you. But whatever hold he's got over you, Lois, sooner or later it'll have to come out. Wouldn't it be better and easier for you if it were sooner? If you told us the whole story? Well, I... I don't want you to answer me now. I'm going to leave you to have a think about it. Just have a think. That's all. Janet? Oh, you're here too, Mark. Well, how did you get on? Yes. Well, Any luck, Mrs. West? Has Lois told you what he's all about? Well, I'm hoping she'll decide to, Mr. Tennant. Now, for the moment, the best thing to do is to leave her alone. Let her make up her mind. Look, Mark, I'm going out. I've got a little shopping to do. I'll come with you. Oh, no, 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 don't be silly. There's no need for that. I just want a few things from the chemist. There's one just round the corner. You stay here with Mr. Tennant. I won't be very long. Uh, Chief Inspector West. Bob Cornish here, Roger. Oh, hello, Bob. Uh, what news from A.Z. Division? Nothing you'll enjoy hearing. Well, no trace of Malone or Pickerel? Not a sniff of him, so far, anyway. Oh. What about the Whistler's strong arm boys? Same goes for them. A lot of them seem to have done a scarper by the looks of it. No. Seems if I was right, doesn't it? Yeah. What are you going to do, uh, pack it in? Oh, not just yet. I'll hang on a bit longer. I wouldn't like Abbott to think I've left any unturned stones or unexplored avenues. <laughs> yes, I know what you mean. <laughs> oh, well, something may turn up. You never know your luck in a big city, as they say. <laughs> All right, Bob. Bye for now. Luck. There was nothing better than that to rely on. Oh, West here. Roger, it's Mark. Oh, hello, Mark. Uh, everything all right? I'm not sure, Roger. What does that mean? Well, I don't know if I should be ringing you, really. I may be jumping the gun. Well, come to the point, Mark. What is it? I'm a bit worried about Janet. What? What's happened? Well, she went out to get a few things from the chemist around the corner, and she's not back yet. Well, how long has she been gone? When, when did she leave the hotel? Well, it's at least an hour ago now, Roger. An hour? Yes. Well, maybe she's taking a stroll or something. Well, that's what I thought. And then I got to thinking about the last time she took a stroll through St. James's Park and what happened. Yes, but that was different. But... Oh, hang on a moment, Mark. That's my other phone. Our Chief Inspector West. <whistles> Hello? <whistles> Hello, who's that? <laughs> Slow on the draw, aren't you, Cover? Malone. Now, if you've got any smart ideas like trying to trace this call, forget them. You won't get the time. Besides, I got someone with me. Go on, let him hear you. Roger. Jan. They grabbed me in the street. I was on the way back to the hotel and a car pulled up. And, okay, uh, that's I enough. Do... Malone. Well, you heard her, eh, if, well? if you've laid a finger on her, you Malone... Know what? <laughs> now, don't make me laugh, Copper. I'm calling the tune and you know it. But she's all in one piece. So far. And I'll offer you a deal. What deal? you got someone I want, I've got someone you want. You... It's a straight swap, West. Your wife for the Randall doll. Malone, Save you can't... Save your breath. And listen to my orders. You get over to that Leggett's Hotel. How the hell did you know about that? <laughs> I got ways of finding out. Now, you collect the girl, just you and her, in your car, and you'll be outside the Victoria and Albert Museum in 45 minutes. Now, Wrap listen, Malone, I... And listen, I said. One of my boys will be waiting at the museum. He'll tell you where to go from there. 45 minutes, West. Got that? Yes. And no funny tricks. No other coppers, no shrewd capers. Or your missus winds up dead. Stone, doornail, dead.
Well, I think that's about all. I've explained the whole situation, and we've got to deal with it ourselves. I don't bring the yard or any other police into this, so... So it's up to you three. Well, you know my answer, Roger, without asking. The same goes for me, Inspector. Thanks, Bill. But Lois is the vital one. Well, Lois... Unless you agree to Oh, this. of course she agrees. Don't you, Lois? Oh, but I'm so frightened. And what about Mrs. West? Hmm? How do you think she's feeling at this minute? If she and the inspector hadn't tried to help you, this wouldn't have happened. Oh, listen, sweetheart, there's no other way. You can't refuse now, can you? But if anything goes wrong... I can't guarantee that it won't, Lois. I, I haven't tried to hide that. It's a risk, love. But you've got to take it. You know you have, don't you? I... Yes, all right. I'll do it. That's my good. Thank you, Lars. I won't forget this. Now, we'll have to get moving. Mark, you take one of these. I'll have the other. Right. What are they? Two-way radios, Lois. Mini size. Unofficial courtesy of Scotland Yard. Malone's playing this cagey. We'll do the same. I've arranged with the hotel proprietor to borrow his car. Here are the keys, Bill. Oh, thanks. You and Mark follow my car, but keep at a reasonable distance. Don't make it obvious. Understood? Understood, Inspector. Right. This is it, then. Let's go. And good luck to us. Pulling up in front of the Victoria and Albert now. Slow down a bit, Bill. Okay. Now, wait a minute. What? And there's someone going up to them. Ah, oh, yes. That'll be Malone's man. Uh, the inspector's moving off again. Hmm. Where to now, I wonder? Uh, Mark, hello. Uh, are you receiving me? Yes, Roger. Loud and clear. My next stop's the Fulham Road, St. Stephen's Hospital. There'll be another man there with further instructions. Malone's not taking any chances, is he? No. Okay, we'll be behind you, Roger. Right. Bill, you heard him. The Fulham Road. Right. Blast it! Bill, we've got to get past that lorry. Our first chance I get, Mark. I can't see Roger's car with that lumbering grip. Now hold it. Yes, we're in luck. The lorry's turning off. Oh, thank heavens. Ah, there's the hospital. Up ahead. Yes. But where's Roger? There's no sign of the car. It's taking a side turning for sure. But which one? Hmm. Well, it should be safe enough to call him now. Roger, do you receive me? Come in, please. I'm receiving you, Mark, yes. We've lost you. Where are you? I'm in Tadema Road. I've just crossed King's Road from Gunter Grove. Bill? It's the second on the left. Roger, where are you making for? You'll never believe it, Mark. I was just going to call you. I'm heading for my final destination, Bell Street. What? Yes, that's where Malone's got Jan and where the exchange takes place. In our own home. Good heavens. Yes, it's a crafty move. With us all at the hotel, the house empty and no police watch on the place. Now, Mark, here's what I want you and Bill to do. Listen carefully. Right. I'm listening, Roger. Fire away. Well, here we are, Lewis. This is my house. That'll be Malone's car for sure. What happens now? We wait right here. I don't understand. In case he's playing any tricks. We don't budge from this car till I know for certain Jan's in there. He'll have at least one of his thugs with him. They'll be watching for us. So it's the whistler's next move. Look! Hmm? At the downstairs window. It's Jan. Well, Inspector? All right. Ready to go, Lewis? Yes, I'm ready. Come on, then. Right. Oh, Inspector. Calm, Lois. Keep calm. Don't think. Just walk up the path to the front door. <sighs> Easy, Lois. It'll be all right. Well... Hello, copper. Welcome home. Pretty pleased with yourself, aren't you, Malone? <laughs> Why not? You've done what you were told, brought the doll. Now me and the boys will take her off your hands. Curly, Jim, let's go. Oh. Not so fast, Malone. Inside, Lois. <coughs> What's the idea? I'll see my wife first, if you don't mind. In the living room, isn't she? Jan. Roger, darling. Are you all right? Not a mark in her copper. Satisfied? Not quite. 
In you go, Lois. Don't stay with Jack. What the hell? You and your boys aren't taking anyone anywhere, Malone. <laughs> You're a raving nutter. We're three to one. I've got reinforcements. Where? The Chelsea pensioners' home? No, right behind you on the stairs. Mark Bill, all right, let's take him. Oh, Come on, Mark, 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 Mark. Oh, well, that's a good job done. Now, by the look of them, these beauties of ours have had more than enough. <laughs> Definitely, Inspector. You and Mark couldn't have timed it better, Bill, I must say. Well, I was a bit worried in case we'd be too late. Yeah, that's a smart idea of yours, Inspector. Sending us the back way to climb in upstairs. Well, that's exactly what a good friend of mine did for me a few days ago, Bill. Huh? That's what gave me the idea. Anyway, nice work all round, huh? Oh, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed myself. Well, yeah. it was right up your street. I mean, an unarmed combat instructor, you're a professional. Oh, you didn't do so badly yourself, you know, Mark. Well, it's nice of you to say so. I must admit I'm not entirely displeased with my little performance, considering this kind of thing is hardly my forte. <laughs> I'm not used to doing anything more belligerent than bashing a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hello. Mr. Malone seems to be coming round. Oh. Copper. I'll get you one day. It'll be a long way ahead, Whistler. You and your mates are going into my garage till I call the squad cars. Then you're going into a cell. You won't keep me in one, West. No coppers can hold me. You'll see. I've got ways. What you've got is a big mouth, Malone, that's all. Come on, up on your feet. <coughs> right, Mark, Bill, take the other two. Yep. I'll call the yard and we'll get these comedians locked away. Then I want to talk with Lois. Perhaps all this will convince her to tell us what she knows. Yes, all right, Inspector. I know it can't be put off any longer. I'll tell you everything I know. That's fine. Uh, you're doing the right thing, Lois, love. Am I, Bill? Roger, mm. perhaps Lois would rather talk to you alone. Oh, it doesn't matter, Mrs. West. It's all got to come out now. Why don't you sit down, Lois? Thank you, but I'd rather stand, Mr. Lessing. Lois, just remember this. Malone's on his way to a cell. Pickerel's a hunted man. You've nothing to fear from them. And certainly nothing to fear from me after what you've done today. But you're a police officer, Inspector West. You'll have to do your duty. Lois, what's that supposed to mean? It means I'm going to lose you. You won't want to marry a thief, Bill, and that's what I am. I see. Well, we'll get one thing straight before you go any further. I'll do the deciding about who I want to marry, and I'm going to marry you, girl, whether you're a thief or a thumping idiot. So that's settled. Bill... All right, now let's hear it, Lois. You say you're a thief. Yes. You see this diamond? Your mother's ring? Lois. I lied to you, Mrs. West. It's what I told everyone. But the truth is I stole it from a jeweler's shop. It was just an impulse. You see, I'd bought a cheap bracelet and I was waiting for my change. There was a tray of rings on the counter. A couple had been looking at them. Now, what's all this got to do with pickerel? Well, that was the beginning. What, you mean you went on stealing? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, that was the first and only time, Bill. I swear it was. But someone saw me do it. A man. He was outside looking through the window. Pickerel? And that's how he came to have the hold over you? Oh, no, Mrs. West. Pickerel didn't come into it until later. Then who saw you take the ring? Whistler Malone? No, but it was someone who worked for Malone. It was a horrible little man. His name was Cox. What name did you say? Cox. Benny Cox. Well, I'm damned. Roger. Oh, hold it, Mark. Lois, did he live in Battersea, Newfield Street, Battersea? Oh, yes, but how did you know that? And you say he worked for Malone? Yes. Cox followed me home that day. And the next evening, Malone turned up. He threatened me, said I'd go to prison unless I did whatever they told me. He really frightened me. I was terrified of him. So you did as they wanted? Yes. And what did they want? Well, it was delivering things mostly, parcels and packages. What was in these parcels? I never knew. Then one day, Malone came and said Benny Cox was dead and told me I was to go to the European Relief and Assistance Society, to Pickerel. I was to work as his secretary. And what else? Continue what I'd been doing, taking packages to various places. And then the business of paying the money into your bank started, Inspector. And you don't know what was really behind all that? No. Hadn't you any idea what Pickerel was up to? No, Mrs. West. I only knew it was something illegal. Well... This doesn't get as much further, Roger, does it? Well, at least it rules out the espionage theory, Mark. Yes. Not because of the data and tape recording. Exactly, Jan. Pickerel was afraid I'd hit on the truth of something I was working on that day. So it was the Benny Cox murder after all. That's where the answer lies. In whatever it was I missed on the 13th of January. <laughs> been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the fifth part of 
Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to Clue from a Captive, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Maurice Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard, and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part six. Clue from a captive. Ah, you're in bed, Jan. Oh, that's fine. Oh, you've been a long time, Roger. Oh, just been getting everyone settled for the night. Mm hmm. Is everything okay? Mm hmm. Yes, I put Lois Randall in the spare room. Mark and Bill Tennant are sharing the boys' room. Oh, it's lucky the boys aren't at home for the holidays. Yeah, just as well with what's been going on. Oh, um, here, yeah, Jan. I've... What's this? Well, I brought a little brandy as a nightcap. Oh, now, darling. Nah, uh, 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 drink it up. It'll do you good. Roger, I'm quite all right, honestly. Now, do as you are told. You'll make sure you'll have a good night's sleep. <sighs> I do wish you'd stop worrying and fussing over me. Well, that was no picnic for you today, Jan. In the hands of Whistler Malone and his thugs. Yes, but it's all over now, and I'm, I, I'm perfectly all right. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm glad we've got Malone where he belongs, behind bars. Now, drink that brandy and no more arguments. Oh, very well. Mm. And um, oh. would you mind moving over a bit? Oh, yes. Sorry, darling. Mm. Oh. oh, bed feels good, I must say. Well, you're the one who needs a nightcap, if you ask me. <sighs> no, it's answers I need, Jan. To a lot of questions. A hell of a lot. You find them. <laughs> Will I, though? Yes, of course you will. No, I'm not so sure. Oh, this is a damn strange case. I thought once I'd found out who was behind the scheme to frame me for taking bribes, I'd, I'd have the whole thing broken wide open. <laughs> oh, how wrong can you be? Well, you know a good deal more now than you did at the beginning. Mm. Well, what does it all add up to? A bunch of loose threads. Malone? His pal, Mr. Pickerel, whom we can't find. Mrs. Fleming and her European Relief and Assistance Society. Mm. Roger. And then there's Lois Randall and her story. I tell you, Jan, this business has more twist to it than a corkscrew. Well, you'll sort it all out, don't worry. Uh, Darling? Mm. What's going to happen about Lois? Well, I'm taking her and Bill Tennant to the yard in the morning room. Mm. We'll see that she makes a statement. No, I mean, after all that... Will she be charged with stealing that diamond ring? No, she'll have to be. She's admitted it. Oh, does that mean she'll have to go to prison? No, no, no. I doubt it. It's a first offence. And seeing that she's cooperating with the police, I'd think, well, she's almost certain to get a suspended sentence. Oh, well, that's a relief. Hmm. <laughs> Still, she's she's going to be in for a life sentence after that, though. Hmm? Bill Tennant's going to rush her off to the nearest registry office. <laughs> yes. Well, good for him. <laughs> yes, for both of them. Now, finish the brandy. Yes, thank you. Ready for lights out, then? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, off to sleep now. I'm in for a long day at the yard tomorrow. Mm. Mm-hmm. Night, darling. Night, my love. Sleep tight. Sweet dreams. Uh, Chief Inspector West speaking. Chetroth here. Oh, good morning, Sky. I'd like a few words, uh, if that's convenient. Oh, yes, of course, sir. Uh, come along to my office, would you? Uh, right, sir. Take a chair, Chief Inspector. Oh, uh, thank you, Sky. Hmm, you're looking rather tired. Oh, I'm all right, sir. Been having something of a rough passage, haven't you? Well, I won't deny that, sir. <laughs> Especially this latest incident uh, with Whistler Malone. He's safely under lock and key, I understand. Yes, sir, in a cell at Cannon Row. And from what I gather, rather the worse for wear. Well, he resisted arrest, sir. I see. 
Nothing at all to do with the fact that he abducted your wife and held her as a hostage, eh? Well, sir, um... <laughs> I don't think that I could blame you, Roger. How is Janet? None the worse for it, I hope. Well, I think she's all right, sir. Nasty experience for her, all the same. Give her my sympathies, if you would. Yes, of course, sir. Though I made it, I'm hardly in her good books. After having suspended you from duty, as I did. I wouldn't say that, sir. I suspect she would, however. Well, you couldn't do anything else in the circumstances, and Jan knows that. In the uh, circumstances, yes. That was just it. I beg your pardon, sir. Hmm? Oh, uh, nothing. Uh, that's to say, nothing that need concern you at the moment. Now, what I'd like now is to review just how far we've got with this whole affair, Roger. Oh, certainly, sir. Seems an infernally tangled business. Oh, it's all of that, sir. Let's concentrate on what we know for certain. First, this European Relief Society and its president, Mrs. Raymond Fleming. She suspected the society was being used for unlawful purposes of some kind by its employee, the man uh, Pickrell. Uh, yes, sir. Now, how about Pickrell? Have we had any luck with him? No, I'm afraid not, sir. No trace at all of where he's got to. Well, I understand there have been several reports. Detective Inspector Cornish followed them up, but, uh, well, they've turned out to be false alarms. Did it? Yes, sir. If we could only lay our hands on Pickerel, we'd have all the answers. As it is, we know he arranged your frame-up. And forced Lois Randall to help. Quiet. And his motive for doing it was fear. Fear that you might hit on something which would place him in danger. Him and his associates, whoever they are. Yes. But we've no idea precisely what bothered Pickerel and his friends. On the contrary, Sir Guy, we now have a very good idea, thanks to Lois Randall's information. Have we, Badger? Well, it was a case I investigated earlier this year, on the 13th of January. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, Pickerel referred to it on the uh, tape recording. Yes, the unlucky 13th, exactly, sir. One of these superstitious fellows, by the sound of it. Well, apparently, sir. And the case? Well, the murder of Benny Cox. Cox? Um, just a moment now. Uh, ah, in Battersea, wasn't it? That's right, sir. Just uh, refresh my memory for me. Well, Benny Cox was found dead in his house in Newfield Street. Um, his brother, Alfred Cox, was tried for the murder. Ah, uh, yes, yes, I recall it now. Uh, he was tried and acquitted. Mm. Many circumstantial evidence, wasn't it? They lived together, but on bad terms. A constant discord, rows and so forth. And that's it, sir. What became of the brother after the trial? Well, he sold the house and left London. Hmm. Well, there hardly seems anything in all that to get Pickerel so anxious. There must be something, though, sir. Something I didn't spot at the time. <laughs> uh, I suppose it could be just the plain fact that Benny Cox worked for Whistler Malone. What? What's this? Yes, sir. That's the link between them. It's the one thing I didn't know at the time. How do you come to know it now? Well, through Lois Randall. So Cox worked for Malone, and Malone was tied in with Pickerel at the European Relief Society. Yes. That may be it then, Roger. I don't know, sir. It still seems a damn small thing for Pickerel to get all worked up over him. Well, hardly enough to make him go to all the trouble of framing me, surely. Chief Inspector, you're an experienced police officer. You know criminals. You've seen them behave in precisely this way time and again, turning molehills into mountains. Oh, of course, but somehow in this instance, well, it's... it seems too simple an answer. <laughs> you know, it occurs to me that you may be standing too close to this case, Roger, trying to read too much into every detail. Go on. Uh, because the case itself is complicated, it doesn't necessarily follow that every element of the case is also complicated. Why, just uh, throw that thought out for what it's worth. Well, I take your point, sir. Anyway, what do you propose to do now? Well, uh, redouble the search for Pickerel, assemble all the information I can get, see what sense it makes, if any. Sound enough. What about Malone? He's been questioned, I take it. Well, Superintendent Abbott's put tiny mirrors onto it, I understand. Mirrors? Hmm. Oh, yes, um, his sergeant, uh, Detective Sergeant Bears. Yes, sir. With what result? Well, I haven't heard yet, sir. Hmm. Do you think Malone's likely to know where Pickerel's hiding out? Or is he just the strong-arm side of the whole operation? Well, he certainly does. But whether he takes his orders from Pickerel or, or knows where to find him, I, I just don't know. Well, uh, keep me informed of developments. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, Roger. Yes, sir? Report to me direct, would you? Uh, well, very good, sir, but... Well... Oh, I was just wondering about um, Superintendent Abbott, sir. I'm still working to him, and, well, he's a stickler for doing everything by the book, as you know. I also know that you are both working to me, Chief Inspector. If the superintendent should make any comment, then refer him to me. Oh, uh, yes, sir. You just get on with the job, Roger. And find out exactly what's at the back of this business. I'll do my best, sir. It's what I expect from you, and I'm depending on it. Perhaps uh, more than you realize. Right, that's all I think for the moment. Carry on, and remember to keep me abreast of the situation at all times. Uh, 
Superintendent Abbott. It's Cornish here, sir. Oh, yes. Where are you, Detective Inspector? Still at Cannon Row, sir. Well? No, hold on a minute, Cornish. Yes, come in. Oh, it's you, Wes. Oh, sorry, Superintendent. I didn't know you were on. Well, come in, come in. I've got Cornish on the line. I sent him to interrogate Malone. I thought Tiny Mears was doing that. Detective Sergeant Mears got nowhere with it. I hope Cornish has done better. Hello? You there, Detective Inspector? Of course, sir. Anything to report? Afraid not, Superintendent. You got nothing out of the man at all? I might as well have been talking to a stone wall. So he didn't say a word? All he did was whistle at me. Very well. Get back here to the yard. No joy, I gather. None. Well, the whistler seems to be playing it very cool, doesn't he? Considering how much we've got on him. Or perhaps I'd better tackle him. No, I'll handle this myself, Chief Inspector. And I think I can say Mr. Malone won't be doing much whistling by the time I've done with him. So the voice of doom's taken over personally, eh, Roger? That's right, Bob. Well, I wish him luck. Which is more than Tiny Mears and I had. Well, when it comes to questioning a suspect, Abbott's pretty formidable. <laughs> I can believe that. After all, he makes even the men who work with him feel like suspects. <laughs> Think he does to keep his hand in. Uh, could be. Mm -hmm. Roger, we're not getting very far with this case, are we? Well, that's an understatement. But I've got one or two new lines of inquiry to follow up. Oh, such as? Well, to start with, I've asked for a list of all the patrons and contributors to the European Relief and Assistance Society. We'll run a check on every single one of them. Well, that's a thought, isn't it? Then I've got this to wade through. Oh, blimey. You'll wind up with eye strain after that little lot. What is it? The transcript of the Cox murder trial. Oh. And as well as that, I've asked Lois Randall to make a list of any addresses she can remember. Addresses? Yes. Or places Pickerel sent her when she was working for him. Oh, I see. Anything you want me to do? Uh, yes, Bob. Uh, do another check round all the divisions, will you? Jog them about the hunt for Pickerel. Oh, do me a favor, Roger. You know what that'll mean? I'll be lumbered with another batch of false scents to go chasing out. Now, one of them might turn out to be the real thing. Okay, okay, Chief Inspector. I'll get started on it right away. Good man. Will you be going around to the pub at lunchtime, Roger? I thought we might have a pint. Uh, not today, Bob. Thanks all the same. I'm planning to live home for a while. I'd just like to make sure all's well at Bell Street. Hello, John. What? what? Oh, Roger. Oh, Jan, love, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you jump like that. Look, I just didn't hear the door. No wonder with this noise. Look, let's turn off that vacuum cleaner, shall we? All right. Now, uh, oh. Hmm. Come here, Jan. Oh, what is it? Well, you're still a bit on edge, aren't you? Oh, nothing of the sort. I don't know. I think that Malone business upsets you more than you're admitting. No, 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 it hasn't. Now, do stop it, Roger, please. Hmm. Well, uh, you like giving me some lunch. Oh, is that what you come home for? Well, I thought as you're getting something for yourself and Mark, uh, I might as well join in. Well, Mark's not here. He's not? No, he went off not long after you did this morning. Where to? Round his fat, he said. What the devil for? Oh, now, really, Roger. Mark Blessing is our best friend, and I know he's been helping these last few days, but he does have a private life of his own, too, you know. Well, he said he wanted to see his publisher and his agent and one or two other people. Well, I wish he'd told me before I left this morning. Oh, why should he? Because I don't like you being alone here in the house. Oh, for goodness sake. And Mark sure. should have known it. I'll call the yard and arrange to put a couple of men on duty in Bell Street. Well, surely you don't imagine anything more is likely to happen. I mean, you've got him alone. But we haven't got his friend, Pickeroon. Not that I think he's liable to try any funny capers. He's too busy keeping undercover. But Pickerel and Malone aren't the only ones involved in this business. There are others behind them somewhere. Mm. Now, you pop off to the kitchen and rustle up some lunch, Jan, while I get onto the yard. I'll feel easier once I've got a watch on this house. Blimey, give it a rest. Well, Father Thames goes rolling on. I'll roll you straight out of this launch right into your old Father Thames in a minute. Talk about being with it. Eh? Have you heard of the top 20? Ah, uh, you can keep your top 20. Call that music. Why, well, it's a bit of tune about the old songs. Ah, here we go again. <laughs> well, what's the matter, Harry, mate? Got out the wrong side of the bed this morning, did you? Got into the wrong side of the force, more like. <laughs> Be a river copper, they said. Join the Thames Division for an exciting life. Ha, ha. Well, it's compensations, you know. River patrol's a lot easier on the plates of meat than found in the odd old London street. Maybe. <laughs> oh. Hello. What's that? See it, Harry, up ahead there? Where? Now, over to starboard. 
floating in the water, near the old wharf. A bit of driftwood, isn't it? No, I'm not so sure. Go on, let's take a closer look. Well, Roger? No false alarm this time, Bob. This is pickerel, right enough. Well, at least they didn't fetch us down here to the Waterloo Pier Station for nothing, eh? Well, if that's any comfort. Well, he'll be in the water for some time, by the look of it. Mm. Too bad he wasn't found before someone put that bullet in him and dumped him in the river. Yes. Just one shot. That's all it took. So he won't tell us anything now. Well, we'll see what the lab men have to say about that. I'll have the ballistics boys do a check on the bullet. Oh, Bob, take over here, will you? I'm heading back to the yard. Oh, some special reason, Roger? Yes, I want to be there when Superintendent Abbott gets back from Cannon Row. I want to know if he got anything out of our friend Whistler Malone. So I'll leave you to look after things this end. Malone. Malone, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Funny, I can't hear a thing. I'll cut out the smart stuff. Oh, copper, you're wasting your breath. Superintendent to you. Oh, Lord, you have got me shaking with fear, you have. Why don't you go bang your head? All right, Malone. I've got plenty of time. So we'll start from the beginning again. I'll be my guest. You know who we're looking for? Now I'll lay odds you know where we can find him. So come on, let's have it. Where's Pickerel? Now what's Pickerel? <laughs> Sounds like some kind of fish. Don't play games with me. We've got all the evidence we need to tie you in with Pickerel and the European Relief Society. I can throw the book at you, Malone, and I'll enjoy oh, doing it. Lord, I want I... to know what Pickerel was up to at the European Relief Society. You were in it with him up to your neck, but you weren't the only one. I wasn't? Well, that's news to me. Like hell it is. Now, come on. I want to hear all about it. Who else is involved? The whole story. So start talking. All right, Superintendent, I'll tell you. Uh, got a fag to spare. Have you on time for a smoke? Yeah. Ah. Now, uh, just lean a bit closer. Well? Superintendent, the whole caper's a gigantic plot to take over the country. By the little people. And the big boss is the king of the leprechauns himself. You You're going to I... go out and arrest a whole lot of them now, can't you? Malone, I tell <laughs> well, you, just I... Just you be sure they don't up and disappear before you can put them in the dock. <laughs> oh, and, uh, thanks for the cigarette, Superintendent. You mean you got nothing out of them at all? That's just what I've just said, isn't it, West? Yeah, but, Superintendent... I'll tell you this. I've interrogated a lot of villains in my time, but I've never met one like this before. Well, Whistler I'll... Malone. A cheap crook. Just a strong-arm thug. But he's as cocky and confident as they make them. What the hell's he got to be so cocky about? We've got him cold for abduction and assault. But that's as far as it goes, West. Where anything more is concerned... Whatever he knows about Pickerel's whole operation, we're going to have to ferret that out ourselves. The hard way. And so it seems. Then what are you waiting around for, Chief Inspector? Hmm? There's plenty for you to do, so get off and get busy. I'll want a progress report from you later in the day. <sighs> oh. Question answer. Question answer. <laughs> Counsel for the prosecution. Now, Mr. Cox, the house in Newfield Street where you lived with your brother, the dead man. It was his property, was it not? Cox, that's right. Mind you, I had an idea that it might not counsel. Just answer yes or no, if you please. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Chief Inspector West. It's me, Roger. Oh, Jan. Uh, nothing wrong, is it? Well, only in... Uh, only in lots. Oh, Ooh, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> you do sound tired. So would you be, too, if you were pouring through the pages of a transcript for the last hour? What? Well, the Bernie Cox murder trial, Jan. I've been reading it up. Oh, I see. Uh, it doesn't seem to be much help, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. Now, what are you ringing about? Um, well, Mark's just phoned me. He said he'll be through with all his various calls by late afternoon, so he'll be back at Bell Street for dinner. I just wondered if you... What time you're likely to get home? Well, ask a silly question, and I see. 
Well, I'd better do a casserole, then it can keep in the oven. Oh, poor Jan. <laughs> Still no regrets about marrying a copper. Oh, as the politicians say, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now, darling. Bye, Jan. Now then, uh, where was I? Roger. Oh, uh, come in, Bob. I've got something for you. What is it, the report from ballistics? No, that's not ready yet. This is the list of addresses you asked Lois Randall to make out for you. Oh, fine. Let's take a look at them. Mm. Well, she's remembered quite a number of them. Good girl. Uh, Regent's Park, Lambeth, Kensington, Bayswater, Hackney, Holborn, Pimlico. Uh, a lot of ground, don't they? Yes, that's right, they do. Well, our late Mr. Pickerel had Lois delivering his mysterious packages over a pretty wide area. Mm, interesting. What do you make of it, Roger? Mm. I don't know. We may get an idea once you've linked these addresses to the names that belong to them. Me? You, Detective Inspector Cornish. <laughs> Thanks. That's what I get for being a new boy at the yard, I suppose. All the big, exciting jobs. Isn't it marvellous? <laughs> Chetworth? Uh, West here, Sir Guy. Yes, Roger. What is it? Uh, well, you asked me to keep you informed of developments, sir. I, um... I thought you might like to know what's been happening so far. Yes, certainly. I'm free at the moment, if that suits you. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, come straight along. And I think that just about covers everything to date, Sir Guy. Hmm. Not a very good day for you, Roger, all things considered. No, afraid not, sir. Pickerill murdered, Whistler Malone not talking. I, I must say, I, I'm rather amazed that Superintendent Abbott uh, couldn't get anything out of him. Interrogation is Abbott's strong point. Yes, I know, sir. So, we're left with the various other lines of inquiry you're pursuing. Yes. What about that ballistics report you mentioned? Well, I'm still waiting for that, sir. I see. Well, it appears to be a matter of just plugging away, eh, Roger? Mm. In the final analysis, and that's how the vast majority of cases are cleared up. By good old-fashioned perseverance. Yes, sir. Frustrating at times, no, of course. Very. <laughs> but we have to learn to live with it. It's a frustrating world for policemen as well as everyone else. Well, that's, that's all now, Roger. Uh, there is one other thing, sir. Yes? Well, it's something I'd like to ask you, Sir Guy. Well? I may be on the wrong track entirely, but I can't help feeling that there's some other element mixed in with this case. Not directly, perhaps, but connected in some way. What makes you think that? Well, actually, it was you, sir, this morning when we were talking. I just had the feeling, nothing I could really put my finger on, I admit, but... Mm. Very perceptive of you. But then uh, that's one of the things which makes a good police officer. Then I'm right, sir. There is something. Yes, uh, but uh, it's something that uh, doesn't affect you at this moment. Though I must confess, one time I thought otherwise. When you suspended me from duty, is that what you mean? As I've said, it's nothing which affects you now. But as an assistant commissioner of police, it concerns me very directly. Now, that's as much as I'm prepared to say for the time being. Well, of course, sir. But surely, if it has anything at all to do with this case, don't you think yes, that I... Yes, yes, when the time comes for you to know more, you can rest assured I'll tell you. Now, I suggest we consider the subject as closed. Come in. Oh, it's you, Wesley. Uh, yes, Superintendent. Well, what is it? Well, you said something earlier in the day about wanting a progress report. Well, here's some real progress, Superintendent. What are you talking about? This. It's just come in, the report from ballistics. Well... Remember Joe Leach, the character who tipped you off about the money he planted in my house? Of course. And who was conveniently murdered before I had a chance to ask him any questions? Yes, yes, I know all about that. Well, here's what you don't know. This report proves conclusively that Pickerel and Joe Leach were murdered by bullets from the same gun. So? And that gun was found on Whistler Malone when we brought him in. So we've got him for murder? Well, if that doesn't break him wide open and make him chat his head off, I don't know what will. Well, I'm off to Cannon Row now. I'm going to shove this report under his nose. Just one moment, Chief Inspector. Yes? I decide who questions Malone and who doesn't. Or have you forgotten that? Well, no, I haven't. But in the circumstances, I just thought I was the logical one to handle it. Oh, did you? You're taking rather a lot on yourself, aren't you, West? Maybe. But you've all had a crack at him. Now it's my turn. And Malone kidnapped my wife. Remember? Goodbye, Superintendent. Ah. 
Wrong here, sir. Hell. This way, Chief Inspector. All right. West. What's Malone? He's out of his cell. After him, Constable. Hey, get him. Oh, nice work, Constable. Oh, flaming coppers. All right, now, hang on to him. You bet, sir. But how the place is. Malone, how'd you do it? Come on, I want an answer. How'd you get out of your cell? I just whistled abracadabra and walked through the wall. Chief Inspector, he's got something in his hand. Right, let's see what it is, Malone. Come on, let's see it, I said. Let go. Come on, open it. Ah. It's a key. Malone had a key to his cell? Yes, Sir Guy. And if you hadn't gone to question him... He just might have got clear away. Now we know why he was so cocky, why he refused to talk. Because he had this? I remember something else now. When I nailed him at Bell Street, he said then, we'd never keep him in a cell. No coppers can hold me. Those were his exact words. Sir Guy. Yes, Roger? What we were talking about this afternoon, what I couldn't put my finger on. This is it, sir, isn't it? Uh, I... Uh... This is the other factor in the case. How did Whistler Malone get hold of this key to his cell? Someone must have given it to him, and that someone has to be... Yes, Roger. A police officer. I've had reason to believe it for quite some time. Now it's proved beyond doubt. So that's it. We've got a renegade copper, a Judas, here at the yard. You've been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in part six of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. Listen to A Date with Justice, the next episode of John Fawcett Wilson's production of Inspector West at Home. Calling Chief Inspector West. Calling Chief Inspector West. Stand by for West. A crime file based on John Creasy's novel, Inspector West at Home, dramatized for radio by Maurice Travers. Inspector West at Home, starring Patrick Allen as Chief Inspector Roger West of Scotland Yard, and Sarah Lawson as his wife, Janet. Part 7, A Date with Justice. A crooked copper here at the yard. That's a hell of a thing, Sir Guy. A bitter pill for any assistant commissioner of police to have to swallow, Roger. One of my own men, a traitor. Hmm. How long have you known about this, sir? Oh, I've suspected it for some months. Now you've brought me the concrete proof. Whistler Malone's attempt to escape from his cell with this key. I take it you've interrogated Malone? Yes, sir. Well... Let's have it. Who gave him this key? It can only have been a police officer. I don't know who it was, sir. What the devil do you mean? Malone's just not talking, sir. Not talking? With a double murder charge against him for the killing of Pickerel and Joe Leach? He still won't say a word, sir. It's my guess he's playing it dumb in the hope that his pal at the yard will make another attempt to help him. Hmm. Uh, we don't know who the blackguard is. Roger, he's got to be found. And found quickly. That's no, not going to be easy, sir. Easy or not, it's your job, Chief Inspector. Mine, sir. Since you came up with that tape recording of Pickerill and cleared yourself of the bribe-taking affair, you're the only man I can be certain of. I'm giving you complete authority to act in this case as of now. Over Superintendent Abbott's head, sir. You're responsible solely to me from this moment. I see. I want the man who handed Malone this key. The man who has betrayed his duty, his colleagues, and everything we stand for. Uh, you're sure that uh, no one apart from the police officers has seen Malone? Oh, no one, sir. Who was the last man to do so? Um, D.C. Thompson. He took him his evening meal. Uh, before that, Malone was questioned by Superintendent Abbott. And by Sergeant Mears and Inspector Cornish earlier in the day. Hmm. But it could be any man in the crime department, sir. Or even one of the women police, for all we know, sir. Well, I'm relying on you. Don't forget that, Roger, will I you? I won't, sir. Yeah, now, uh, I think we'd both better pack off home. It's late and I'm feeling rather tired. Cigarette, Roger. Oh, thanks, Mark. 
Well, it's been a pretty grim day for you, one way or another. Oh, about as grim as they come. Pickerel found shot and dumped in the river. Malone sitting in his cell at Cannon Row, not saying a word, and me. Well, I'm no closer to finding out why I was framed and what's behind it all. And now, on top of everything, you've got to uncover a guilty copper. Yes, and how do I do that? I can't put a watch on every man in the department. Now, it's damn difficult setting a copper to catch a copper. Then what are you going to do, darling? Well, there's only one thing I can do, Jan. Mm-hmm. Tackle it from the other angle. How do you mean? Well, concentrate on digging out exactly what Pickerel was up to at the European Relief and Assistance Society. Now, once I've done that, it's got to lead me to the yard man involved. Roger, do you think this renegade copper could be the real brains behind this whole business? Oh, there's no way of knowing. But we can't rule out the possibility. Uh, you'll stand by, Mark, won't you, in case I should need you? Like a shot. Then you'd better stay the night here, Mark. Oh, splendid thought, Mrs. West. Well, I'm off for bed. Ooh. Tomorrow's going to be a critical day. I've got to see Chatworth first thing in the morning. Oh, Roger. Come in, come in. Oh, good morning, Sir Guy. Oh, let's hope it proves to be. You haven't seen Superintendent Abbott yet, I take it? Oh, no, sir. I've informed him that the case is now in your hands. Uh, you, uh, you and Abbott uh, don't hit it off very well, do you? Well... I can't say that we do, sir. <clears throat> now, Roger, what's the situation on the case at this moment? Well, the superintendent's running a check on all the patrons of the European Relief Society, also the contributors to it. Good, good. Then uh, Detective Inspector Cornish is following up the list of addresses Lois Randall made out for me. Ah, yes. Where Pickerill sent her to deliver those uh, parcels or packages or whatever. Uh, yes, sir. Cornish is hunting up the names that belong to the addresses. Anything else? Well, there's this. What is it? The transcript of a murder trial, sir. The Benny Cox murder. Have you still got that bee in your bonnet? Oh, call it what you like, Sir Guy. But from what Pickerel said on the tape recording, we know that my frame-up was organized because he was scared. He was afraid I'd get on to the whole truth about the 13th of January. The day Benny Cox was murdered. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But you've already unearthed what that was. The fact that Cox worked for Whistler Malone, and thus by extension for Pickerel. Oh, I still feel there's more to it than that. And I think I may have found a hint in this transcript. What sort of hint? Well, it's just here, sir, where the uh, prosecuting counsel is questioning the accused Benny Cox's brother. Ah, here we are. Uh, Listen, Sir Guy. Now, Mr. Cox, the house in Newfield Street where you lived with your brother, the dead man, it was his property, was it not? Cox. That's right. Mind you, I had an idea that it might not. Counsel, just answer yes or no, if you please. Well, well, perhaps I'm dull, Chief Inspector, but... Uh, None of that means very much to me. Well, it didn't to me at first either, sir. But you'll notice that the prosecutor cut off Alfred Cox in mid-sentence. Now, suppose that Cox had been allowed to finish what he was going to say. What of it? And suppose it was something like this. That Cox had an idea his brother didn't really own the house. That it really belonged to someone else. But that's sheer speculation. Just guess for it. Admittedly. And I can't ask Alfred Cox, seeing that he's up stakes and left London after his acquittal. But he was believed to have sold the house. Now, if it wasn't his house to sell, then who is the real owner? Oh, Roger, I think you're clutching at straws here. Maybe. And if you want another piece of guesswork, I'd say Whistler Malone murdered Benny Cox. Hmm. Well, all right. Leave the matter of the house in Newfield Street with me. You've got enough on your plate. Well, thank you, sir. What's your next move, Roger? A visit to number 11, Bannock House, sir. Bannock House? Mrs. Raymond Fleming's flat, the uh, European Relief Society's founder and president. It was thanks to her I got the tape recording that put me in the clear. She may be able to help me further, and I don't want to waste any time. The faster we can get to the bottom of this whole thing, the better. Pickerel? Murdered? Yes, Mrs. Fleming. Good heavens. He was found in the river, you say? By a police launch from the Thames Division. Well, all his superstitions didn't help him, did Hmm? they? Uh, How do you mean? Don't you remember, Inspector, on that tape? He went on about the unlucky 13th. He's obviously a highly superstitious man. Mm. Inspector, does this mean you've managed to discover what he was using the society for? What his criminal activities were? Uh, No, Mrs. Fleming. Nor who's really behind it. Surely that's perfectly plain. Pickerel himself. Ah, but he had other associates. The the friends he spoke of on the tape. Doesn't that mean Malone and those thugs of his? That's possible. Annette, my dear. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had someone with you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Fleming. It's Chief Inspector West, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. May I ask what brings you here again? Well, I um, I wanted a few words with your wife, Mr. Fleming. I'm at a loss to think why. Raymond. Please, my dear. I was under the impression, Inspector, that we'd have no more visits from the police. Well, the case isn't concluded yet, sir. And until it is, 
We have to continue with our inquiries. I'm sure Annette has already told you everything she knows about the entire unfortunate episode. And Superintendent Abbott took my statement. I'm well aware of that, of course. Well, then... But I thought there might possibly be something that your wife had overlooked, Mr. Fleming. Something that might be important. Now, that kind of thing can easily happen. It hasn't happened in this instance, I assure you, Inspector. You know how much the society means to me. How anxious I am to avoid any unfavorable publicity. As I've told you more than once, my dear, the best way of doing that is simply to terminate its existence. Oh, Raymond, for heaven's sake. My views on the matter have not changed, Annette. If anything, I disapprove more strongly than ever of the whole thing. Raymond, dear, I'm sure the last thing the inspector wants to listen to is a family squabble. Hmm? Oh, oh, of course. I'm sorry, my dear. Uh, do forgive me. And my apologies to you, too, Inspector. Oh, no need for it, Mr. Fleming. Oh, but indeed there is. I'm afraid I allowed my feelings to get the better of me. I'm not a believer in airing one's differences in public. Old-fashioned of me, no doubt, in these uh, permissive times. But there it is. Now, if there's nothing further you want with my wife... Uh, not for the moment. However, if there should be anything else you happen to recall, Mrs. Fleming, uh, no matter how trifling it may seem, I, I trust you'll let me know at once. Naturally, she will. Uh, you know where to contact me, Scotland Yard. Well, I'll say goodbye. Uh, no, uh, please don't trouble to see me out. I know the way. Uh, Chief Inspector West. Good morning, sir. Detective Inspector Cornish reporting. Oh, hello, Bob. What's all the formality in aid on? <laughs> I just thought I'd better start minding my P's and Q's now you're running the whole show. Well, save yourself the effort. But I didn't know it was general currency already. Oh, the, the whisper gets around, you know. And I've got ears like radar screens, don't forget. Yes, I have noticed. <laughs> I'll bet it's put Abbott's nose out of joint. What did he say? Well, I haven't seen him yet. Uh, Bob, um, how are you getting on with that list of, of addresses? We haven't got through them all yet. What do you mean by we? I thought I sent you on that job solo. Oh, that's right. But yesterday, when Abbott was still in charge, he detailed his sergeant onto it with me. Did he now? So for my sins, I'm landed with tiny mirrors. Hmm. Well, uh, what have you turned up so far? Damn all. You mean you haven't been able to match any of the names to the addresses? Oh, we've managed that, all right. Well, for what good it does, but we found no one at home. Every time, Roger. Oh, blast. All the geezers concerned seem to have done a scarper. Uh, all right, Bob. You and Mears check the rest on the list. And then you get back to me as soon as you can with the results. Will do. Uh, bye, now. Uh, oh, come in. Oh, Superintendent Abbott. Yes. The situation being what it is, I've come to your office, Chief Inspector. I'd like to know what's been going on. Going on? Behind my back. Oh, sorry, I'm... I'm not quite with you, Superintendent. Like hell you're not. Now, don't play funny beggars with me, West. I wasn't trying to. Now, what seems to be the matter? Plenty. In my book. I've been given to understand by the Assistant Commissioner that you are now in charge of this case. Oh, I see. Well, I don't. I've been in the force a good many years, West. And this is the first time I've known an A.C. put any officer in authority over one with higher rank. Well, there's no question of that, Superintendent. Not as I see it, anyway. Don't give me that. According to the book, there's oh, been superintendent, no... Oh, Superintendent, for once, just once in your life, let's forget about the book, shall we? Look, as far as I'm concerned, I take this new arrangement to mean that I have to report to Sir Guy Chatworth direct, that's all. Now, apart from that, when it comes to doing the job, I'm assuming that you and I will simply go on working together, just as we have been. Oh. I thought... Together, be... that's the operative word, Superintendent, in my book. Now, have you any objection to that? Well, I was... No. No objection. Just as long as that means I'll be kept up to date with everything. All new developments. Yes, of course. Right. I'll get back to my office then. Oh, we're speaking. Chatworth here, Roger. Oh, yes, sir. And that business about the Cox House in Newfield Street, Paris. Oh, yes, sir, Guy. I did as I promised and uh, checked out. Well, sir? Seems you were right, Roger. Benny Cox wasn't the real owner. No, he was not. Then who was, sir? The house is registered as being the property of Mrs. Raymond Fleming. Chelsea 1492? And about time, too. Oh, Roger. Who the devil have you been talking to, Jan? The phone's been engaged for ages. Oh, well, I rang Gloucestershire to have a little chat to the boys. Little chat, huh? Oh, I'd hate to think what it's done to our phone bill. 
<laughs> well, of course, are the phone bills more important than your own sons, Mr. <laughs> West? No, I didn't say that, did I? Ah, oh, the young demons. Oh, the young demons having a time of their lives. According to Martin, these are the best school holidays he and Richard have ever had. Which probably means they're eating my poor cousin out of house and home. Uh, more than likely. Oh, Jan, I want to talk to Mark. He's there, isn't he? Um, yes, hang on, I'll get him. Oh, Mark, it's for you. Right here, Janet. It's Roger. Oh, thank you. Yes, Roger. Uh, Mark, I've got a job for you. I'm listening. I want you to get over to Hampstead, Bannock House. Bannock House? Where Mrs. Fleming lives? Uh, yes, that's right. Now, I'll give you time to get there, and then I'll be phoning her. Now, I want you to watch the place and keep track of her movements, if any. Got that? Got it. Ah, uh, good chap. I'll leave at once. Your personal private bloodhound's on his way. Ears flapping and nose to the ground. Hello? Uh, is that Mrs. Fleming? Yes. Uh, Chief Inspector West here. Uh, there's something I'd like to ask you, if, uh, if you could spare a moment. Certainly, Inspector. Uh, will you tell me if this address means anything to you? Number 25, Newfield Street. 25, Newfield Street. That's right. In Battersea. Uh, well, Mrs. Fleming. No, I'm afraid it doesn't mean a thing, Inspector. Uh, what about the name Cox? Benny Cox? Sorry, that means nothing either. Oh, I see. Uh, well, thank you. May I ask what this is all about, Mr. West? Oh, just a routine inquiry, that's all. Goodbye, Mrs. Fleming. Goodbye. Annette? Oh. Uh, who were you talking to? Hmm? What did you say, darling? I said, who were you talking to? On the phone. Uh, oh, it uh, it's just Sybil Kenrick. She wants me to have lunch next week. Rather a brief conversation, wasn't it, for Sybil? Well, I, I cut her short. She does go on. I'm not in the mood today. Annette. Yes? Is everything all right with you, my dear? Oh, yes, of course. Why do you ask? Well, only because you you seem somewhat distray. Ever since that policeman, West, called this morning. Oh, nonsense, Raymond. You're sure there's nothing you'd like to tell me? Of course not. Annette. I should hate you to feel that you couldn't confide in me. You know, you mustn't let a little thing like our difference of opinion over that society of yours upset you. It doesn't, darling, not at all. Oh, heavens, I've just remembered. I have an appointment at the hairdresser. I'll have to rush. Raymond, you'll be home for the rest of the day, won't you? Yes, I imagine so. Why? Well, I might have a little surprise for you when I get back, that's all. Must run now. Bye, darling. Oh, you're still here, West. I didn't know whether you'd gone off to lunch. Oh, thanks for reminding me, Superintendent. Oh, what have you got then? The rundown on the patrons and contributors to the European Relief Society. Oh, good. But you can see for yourself, it's a blind alley. All perfectly respectable people. No grounds for suspicion of any of them. Uh... And what's doing with the other lines of inquiry? How about Cornish's assignment? They're not complete yet. I'm waiting to hear him. Any luck elsewhere? Well, uh, there may be. Oh? But I'd uh, rather not say more till I can be sure, Superintendent, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Well, suit yourself, Chief Inspector. Fine. Oh, and since you mentioned lunch, I, I think I'll pop out and grab a snack. I'll be in the usual pub if there's anything urgent, Superintendent. <laughs> Sure, you wouldn't like you the sausage, Mr. West? Not many left. Oh, no, thanks, Sandra. I've done nicely, thank you. Roger? Roger? Oh, Bob. Abba told me I'd find you here. What do you have, Bob? The usual? Thanks very much. Uh, Sandra, a pint for Mr. Cornish, please. Certainly, Mr. West. Come right away. Well, I take it this means you and Tiny Mears have finished the job. Yes, we've finished. Here's the list for you. Yeah, all I'll the go. names alongside all the addresses. Uh-huh. Hmm. You know, Roger, I always thought there was only one invisible man. Huh? That little lock proves me dead wrong, doesn't it? Well, I'm not so sure. Eh? There's something about this list that rings a faint bell. Here we are, your part, Mr. Cornish. Oh, thanks. No, 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 I'm getting this. Uh, there you are, Sandra. Thank you, Mr. West. Uh, Bob, I'll say cheers and leave you to it. I, I want to see if I can make that bell ring a bit louder. So long for now. Uh, Chief Inspector West. Ah, oh, yes, Sergeant. Uh, got that information for me? Right, let's have it. No, no, slow down a bit, Sergeant. I'm trying to write it all down. Mm-hmm. All right, got that. Now, what about this uh, Arthur Spencer? Andrew Sedgman, alias Arthur Spencer. Served five years for receiving, yes, 57 to 61, right? What, sir? Also alias one. Andre Santerre. Right, thanks a lot. What? Yes, quite right. 
What would we do without the records office? Goodbye. Andre Santerre. I wonder. Uh, this is Chief Inspector West. I want to call through to Interpol Paris, the International Bureau. And don't waste any time over it. There's a good girl. Yes, thank you. I'm very grateful to you, Monsieur Lanspector. What? Well, helped. Well, it's helped a very great deal. In fact, I'd say you've given us just what we've been looking for. Well, thanks again. Uh, merci. Goodbye. Well, that's the answer, all right, Sir Guy. It can't be anything else. Stolen jewelry? Yes, on a vast scale. In the last 12 months, there's been a rash of jewel thefts all over the continent. Hmm. Interpol have a dossier an inch thick on André Santerre, alias Arthur Spencer, alias Andrew Sedgman. Well, uh, what's the connection? Well, he's a fence, jewelry only. It's his specialty. And you say at least three of the other names on this list are also fences? That's the information from our own criminal records office. I'd say that gives us a pretty good idea what was in those packages Lois Randall had to deliver when she was working for Pickerel. Then the European Relief Society was, was being used as a front, yes. The clearinghouse for a huge distribution setup. The stolen jewels smuggled from the continent, brought to the society, and from there filtering through to a network of fences. Now, for all we know, even the thefts themselves might have been planned from there. And the Fleming woman was behind the whole thing. It all points that way, sir. But, Roger, damn it, she was the one who tipped you off. She gave you the tape recording. Oh, wait a minute. Double bluff, eh? Could be, couldn't it, sir? If Pickerel had taken it on himself to organize my frame up and she thought he'd gone too far. Hmm. Her way of killing two birds with one stone. Hmm. Caring you and diverting suspicion from her society and herself. Oh, excuse me. Yes, sir. Chatworth? Oh, Sir Guy, it's Mark Lessing here. I understand Chief Inspector West's with you. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. Uh, it's for you, Roger. Oh. Uh, your friend Lessing. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mark, any news? There certainly is. Mm -hmm. I followed the good lady from Bannock House. She went into the West End to an airline office. She's booked two seats on a flight to Nice. When for? Have you any idea? Of course I have. What kind of a bloodhound do you think you've got? It's this afternoon, Roger. The 5.30 flight from London Airport. Oh, nice work, Mark. What do I do now? Uh, no more, thanks, Mark. Um, you can go back to Bell Street and keep Janet company. Right you are. Now, bye, Mark. <laughs> Mrs. Fleming's planning to leave the country, Sir Guy. Is she, by God? In that case, you'd better have her picked up at once. No, sir. Not just yet. Why not? We still want to lay our hands on our bent copper, don't we? Certainly we do. That's the most vital thing of all. And here's how we do it. Uh, first, there's a telephone number I want put out of order, say, from 4.30 this afternoon. No difficulty about that. And then, round about that same time, I'd like the news spread through the yard that I've put my finger on the whole setup behind the European Relief Society. And I'll be making an arrest at about 6.30. I see. We're setting a trap, are we? One for our man to walk into and incriminate himself completely. And what will you be doing? Uh, me, sir? I'm planning to take a run out to London Airport. Well before the 5.30 flight for Nice is due to make its departure. Well, I must say, Annette, when I got up this morning, I didn't imagine I'd be sitting at London Airport by the afternoon. Raymond, darling, you're sure you don't mind the way I've bustled you into this? You know how much I love to do things on the spur of the moment. And it is a nice surprise, you must admit. It's a delightful surprise, my dear. Quite suddenly, I just couldn't bear the thought of London for a day longer. Well, I confess that the prospect of spending a little time on the Riviera is highly agreeable. <laughs> and who knows? We might decide to go on from there. The world, as they say, is our oyster. If I have any quibble at all, my dear, it was the necessity for arriving here quite so early. Our plane doesn't leave for at least another half hour. <laughs> then we've got plenty of time to have our coffee, haven't we? All right, we? you wait here, Constable. Annette! Look. Inspector West. Good afternoon, Mrs. Fleming. I'm afraid I must ask you to come with me. Come with you? Now, just a moment. We have some questions we want to ask your wife, Mr. Fleming. I imagine you'll want to be with her. I've got a car waiting. Let's go nice and quietly, shall we? And let me tell you that I consider this utterly outrageous. What possible charges can you have to lay against my wife? The charges, Mr. Fleming, they start with receiving stolen property and go on to being an accessory to murder both before and after the fact. An accessory? That's completely absurd. The moment this car gets to Scotland Yard, I shall telephone my lawyer. We're not going to the yard. Where are you taking us, then? To your flat, Mrs. Fleming, to number 11 Bannock House. We're going to wait there. Just the three of us. All right, Mr. Fleming, open the door. Constable, yep. I want you two men to wait round behind those lifts. Keep out of sight until I call you. Right, Inspector. All right, come on now. Let's get inside, Mr. Fleming. 
You're going to be very sorry for all this, Inspector, I promise you. We'll see. We most certainly will. The moment I get on the phone. Come along, Annette. You know your mistake, Mrs. Fleming. It was a big one. You lied to me about the house you own in Newfield Street. What are you talking about? I don't own a house. It's in your name. Raymond. Leave this to me, my dear. Once I've talked to my lawyer... What the devil? The phone's gone dead. I suggest you don't trouble, Mr. Fleming. I am not asking for your advice. Oh, confound the thing. Raymond, the mirror. Oh! You were standing too close to the phone. It's broken. It doesn't matter, darling. It's not important. Of course it's important. A broken mirror. That, that's bad luck. Seven years bad luck. Don't you know that? I wasn't aware you believed in that kind of thing, Mr. Fleming. He doesn't, Inspector. Of course not. Oh, but he does, Mrs. Fleming. Just look at him. Is it only mirrors, Fleming? Or are you superstitious about numbers, too? Like 13, the unlucky 13th? What do you mean? You, Fleming. That's what I mean. Now it all makes sense. So does the house in Newfield Street. You own it in your wife's name. Oh. Now, we thought Pickerel was the superstitious one. And your wife encouraged us to think that, didn't you, Mrs. Fleming? Because you knew it was your husband. You've known all along. He's the brains behind it all. He's the one who's using your society as a clearinghouse for stolen jewels. Inspector! But if you were so keen to shield him, why the devil tip me off in the first place? Why give me that tape recording? If you knew... You me... damn fool! Raymond, I did it for you. I thought once you knew the police were making inquiries into the society, you'd stop it all. Put an end to the whole thing and you'd be safe. Safe? You stupid. It was for you, Raymond, for your sake. Quiet. (gasps) Who's that? Someone I've been expecting. A little trap. That's why your phone's not working, Fleming. So that your silent partner would have to come here to warn you in person. Now we'll see just who he is. Come on, Fleming. We'll go and let him in. You open the door. I'll be here, just behind him. Now, go on. Open it. Oh, Fleming, I couldn't get through on the phone. You'll have to beat it. Bob fast. Cornish. Who the... Detective Inspector Cornish. Well, well, well. Constable at the double, both of you. Right, sir. Don't try any clever stuff you haven't to hope. Well, looks like the jig's up, eh, Roger? Chief Inspector to you. Sorry, I'm sure. So that's why I kept getting beaten to the punch. Now it all adds up. Why Joe Leach was killed before Mark Lessing could ask him any questions. How Malone knew we were all at Leggett's Hotel and was able to kidnap my wife. And I had to put you onto tracking down that list of addresses. No wonder every man on it had disappeared. And it goes right the way back, doesn't it? Does it? To the Micklejohn murder. I suppose Whistler Malone did that little job, too, after you warned him that we were going along to talk to him. How long have you been tied in with Malone? Since your days in AZ Division before you got your transfer to the yard? hmm? Probably little Sherlock Holmes you are, aren't you? Uh, Just one question. Why? Why? (laughs) You were just too good to be true, aren't you? You think any man should be happy to sweat his life away all the hours of the day and night and finish up on a pension? All for the honor and glory of being a copper. No, Mr. Cornish. Not for anything like that. Because it's a job that has to be done, that's all. Not that you'd understand that. All right, Constable. Get him and Fleming down to the car and to where they belong. Behind bars. Yes, Inspector. Then report to Superintendent Abbott. And if he wants to know where I am, I've gone home. been listening to Patrick Allen and Sarah Lawson in the final part of Inspector West at Home by John Creasy. (laughs) Inspector West at Home was produced for the BBC by John Fawcett Wilson.